Yeah, let me go ahead and call a roll and, and see where we are. Um, Mr. Stilwell, Mr. Botts, and Mr. Shard, good morning, gentlemen. All right, Mr. Williams, Mr. Steele, Mr. Adams, and Ms. Renard, good morning. All right, Mr. Kendrick and uh, Mr. Weinstein, good morning. All right, Mr. Healy and Messrs. Junior, uh, Matt, Matthews Jr. and Sr. All right, good morning. Mr. Nichols, Mr. Westmoreland, I mean, Ms. Westmoreland, Mr. Harvey, and Mr. Garner, good morning. All right. And uh, Mr. Ryan and Misty Williams, good morning. All right, Ms. Love and Ms. Uh, Hilton. Good morning. Mr. Brown, Mr. Smith, and Mr. Atkins, good morning. Good morning, Ron. All right. Okay, before I bring out our jurors, anything I need to take out? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, come on up. Seems that good?
Okay. If, unless there's anything else, I'll call for our jurors, okay? All right. So, anyone, if you could summon our jurors, please. All right, so jurors. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. All right, thank you, Sergeant Ingram. <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, jury, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, we're going to go ahead and continue with the presentation of the state's case. So, um, call your next witness. Yes, Your Honor. The state calls Officer Curtin Reagan to the stand. All right. Officer Raymond, is that his last name? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, sir. Officer Raymond, good morning, sir. Sir, if you could please approach the witness stand. Once you get there, if you'd be so kind and turn and face Sergeant Ingram and be sworn as a witness before you sit down, please. I'm ready right here. You swear for a testimony, give the name the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth. I do. Absolutely. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm Officer Curtin Raymond, K I R T O N R A Y M O N D. Good morning, Officer Raymond. How are you? I'm doing, I'm doing well, sir. Uh, can you please tell the jury where you are employed at? Uh, City of Atlanta Police Department. And how long have you been employed with Atlanta Police Department? For approximately uh, nine years now. Uh, and what was, what is your current position with AC? I'm a police officer and uh, I patrol currently now B305. And B305 is in what zone? Uh, zone 3, sir. Can you describe for the jury where is B305 in zone 3? Uh, some of the main streets in uh, 305's beat is uh, um, Pryor, Maury, the Copper, the Copper, Copper Homes, Copper School um, area. And when you first started, uh, what beat or zone did you work for? I was still in zone three. I worked uh, beat 313, which was um, the south side of Jonesboro Road. Understood. And so uh, have you been, what, while working in these beats and uh, zones, are you a patrol officer? Yes, I'm a patrol officer. Um, on, a, on a regular day, I get a wide array of calls um, from stolen vehicles, um, fight calls. It, it's, it's a wide array. On, on, a, on a usual day, you could get from criminal trespass to somebody in the an accident report, all that different stuff. And are you post-certified uh, now, Officer Raymond? Yes, sir, I am. And were you post-certified in September of 2019? Yes, sir, I was. Can you turn your attention to September 25th, 2019? Were you mm -hmm. working that day? Yes, I was working. Um, and back in September 2019, what beat were you working? Zero three five. You pull that in. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was working uh, beat 313. And what shift were you working back then? Evening shift, which is from uh, 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. And did you have, uh, how did you get involved in this? Um, the call came up, Officer Cogdell, he was, um, he tried to 
uh, perform a traffic stop on a, on a red, on a red. Well, what's the basis, Mr. Botts? I'm sorry? You're saying he was reported to him. He had no basis. I'm overrule your objection. All right. You may answer, officer. Yes, so Officer Cogdale tried to perform a traffic stop on the vehicle. It fled from him. Um, and then um, he put over the radio that he, the vehicle pretty much crashed out right at the intersection of um, Cleveland Avenue and 75, the 75 ramp. Now, when you first heard this from the dispatch, where were you located at? I was on my beat in, three, one, in 313 speed. I was all the way down by Jonesboro Road, right around uh, the 285 um, junction. And how long did it take you roughly to get to that location? Uh, approximately about uh, eight to ten minutes, sir. And when you got there, what did you see? Um, when I got there, I saw a white Ford Fusion airbags deployed. It was in the middle. It was in the middle of the intersection, and there was also a red Nissan Sentra with a Florida tag. It was on the right side of uh, Cleveland Avenue. Your Honor, permission to approach. You may, sir. I'm handing the witness what's been marked as States 25, Quebec. Officer Raymond, uh, <coughs> what is that? That's the that's the accident that happened uh, when Officer Cogdell was um, chasing the vehicle. That's the white uh, Ford Fusion with the airbags deployed. And how do you recognize it? I did an accident report um, on that vehicle. And is that a fair and accurate depiction of the scene this day? Oh, yes, sir, it was. The only thing that's literally missing is just the red Nissan Sentra, um, and I think it should be on the right side. Of the highway. Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, the state moves to admit uh, states is 25 <coughs> Quebec to evidence. Any objection? States 25 Quebec. Hearing none, uh, 25 Quebec is admitted and then we publish as you see fit. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the state's going to publish states 25 Quebec, and also Raymond. Uh, is this the scene that you picked or had you described when you got to this location? Oh, yes, sir, it is. And with the white Ford Fusion, where was the damage located on that vehicle? The damage was um, on the on the left side, the, dr the driver's side. Yeah, on the, yeah. And can you describe what is this intersection that we are looking at in States 25 Quebec? So, so it's going to be right at the intersection of Cleveland Avenue, and um, it's going to be the 75 uh, ramp. And uh, when did you ever interact with uh, any occupants of the White Ford Fusion? Yeah, Mr. Montgomery, he was laying on the floor. Um, I believe Grady Unit was rendering aid to him. Um, he was laying. He was laying on the right side, if I remember correctly. He was laying on the right side, and they would try to make sure he was okay after the accident. Understood. Your Honor, permission to approach? You may, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> I'm handing the witness what's been marked as States uh, 26, Quebec. Also, Raymond, what did I uh, just hand you? Oh, that's Mr. Mis Mr. Montgomery. Um, right after the accident, like I said, he got out of the vehicle and he laid down, and we were just trying to make sure he was okay. Well, the other officers in the greater unit on scene. And how were you able to uh, recognize it? Um, As in, uh, how, how are you able to know what's depicted in States 26 with that? Um, because I was, I, I recognize him because I did the report for him. I interacted with him that day. Uh, and is it a fair and active representation uh, of Michigan government that day? Yes, yes it is. Your Honor, the state moved to admit States 26 for that into evidence. Any objection? Other than what's been noted already. No, we are. Okay, all right. Um, 26 uh, Quebec is admitted, uh, and Thank the court you, will note the continuing objection. Uh, publishing states in 26 Quebec. Uh, also, Raymond, who is this gentleman depicted on this uh, exhibit? Uh, it's Mr. Montgomery, sir. And uh, when you get to a scene, you process an accident report. Can you kind of describe to the jury what you do, what information you get? <clears throat> So a, when you're doing an accident report, you want to um, get both drivers, if possible, get the tags of both vehicles. Um, you want to assess the damage and where the damage is um, exactly on both vehicles, um, kind of to investigate, see who's at fault, um, how the accident happened. Also, you want to run the vehicles, see who the owner belongs to, well, see who the vehicle belongs to, see if there's valid insurance and stuff like that. And were you able to run any information or, uh, related to the red Nissan? Oh, yes. I was able to run. It was a Florida tag, but I was able to run the 
from the tag on our system, and it came back to her torrential. And were, uh, what state were the uh, plates on that red Nissan? It was a Florida tag. And uh, when you respond to a traffic accident, mm -hmm. do you ever uh, depict uh, what, like how the accident looked for the record? Yes, you do. Um, it's, it's mainly for the insurance companies. You pretty much want to paint a mental picture or a good picture for them about what happened in an accident. So usually on our programs, one of the tools that we use is a picture that we actually draw out in the accidents to, again, just to show the insurance company and suicide fall and where exactly the damage was and uh, what exactly happened. Your Honor, permission to approach? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm handing the witness what's been marked as State's Exhibit 27, Quebec. Officer Raymond, what is State's Exhibit 27, Quebec? Um, that's the diagram from the accident report that I, that I did. And how do you recognize it? Um, I, it's, it, it depicts what happened uh, that day. Is it a fair, accurate depiction of the uh, traffic report that you created? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, it is. Your Honor, the state moves to admit State's Exhibit 27, Quebec, into the record. Any objection to State's 27, Quebec? Hearing none, it is admitted and may be published as you see fit. Thank you, Your Honor. Publishing State's Exhibit 27, Quebec. So, also, Raymond, when you uh, review traffic reports, mm -hmm. uh, how do you name or classify the vehicles involved? Is it numbers or letters, or how do you do that? In the accident report, um, there are different units um, based on the vehicle. So, for instance, if there's two vehicles, it's going to be unit one, unit two. And so on. So, unit one is the one is the, is the vehicle that's going to be at fault. Unit two is the vehicle that's not at fault. And in this uh, exhibit, what vehicles is unit one? Unit one is going to be the vehicle traveling on Cleveland Avenue, and unit two. Well, let me elaborate. Unit one is going to be the the Ford Fusion. No, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, my mistake. Unit one is going to be the the Ford the, the Ford Fusion. Unit two. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know what? You know what is going to be the, the Nissan Sentra because it ran the light and it T boned unit number two. And the roadway going vertical on this exhibit. Yes, sir. What road is that? Uh, that's Cleveland Avenue. And is the horizontal one what road is that? That's the 75, 75 ramp. And, uh, and so in, in this. State's Exhibit 27, uh, the vehicle that's horizontal is which car again? The vehicle that's horizontal going is going to be a uh, vehicle number two, unit number two. <clears throat> and uh, after obtaining this information, did you have any further involvement with this case? Uh, no, all I did was just the accident report. One brief moment, Your Honor. Yes, sir. And uh, also, Raymond, uh, was what vehicle was or what type of vehicle was the Nissan? It was a vehicle at fault. And what was the uh, do you remember the naked model of it? Yeah, it was uh, the vehicle at four was a red uh, Nissan Sentra. <laughs> One read on the ground. Yes, sir. <coughs> Your Honor, I'm going to grab what's been previously admitted as State's Exhibit 22, Quebec.
Your Honor, I'm going to hand the witness what's been previously admitted to State Exhibit 3Q and published State Exhibit 3Q. Officer Raymond, do you, do you recognize the vehicle in State Exhibit 3Q? Uh, yes, I do. Is that 23Q? Uh, 3Q, Your Honor. You got 23Q up. There you go. Okay. And was that the vehicle that was unit one in your report? Yes, sir, that was the vehicle. Thank you, Officer Raymond. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross. Officer Raymond. Yes, sir. In police vernacular, police vernacular, this is called a reported accident, is it not? Yes, sir. Sir. Yes, sir. So that means that you weren't a witness to anything? No, I wasn't, sir. Other than you arrived on the scene. And part of your duty, as you said, is to make out a report for insurance purposes. Yes, sir. And that's what you put in your actual report itself for insurance purposes. It was filled out. Yes, sir. So when you testified earlier that somebody ran a red light, somebody was at fault. You don't know who ran a red light, correct? Well, I wasn't there personally, but... Uh, right. And in these type accidents... Let me finish. Let me finish. Well, I, I'm afraid he may get into hearsay, Your Honor. I'm asking... He was about to say something when you cut him off. All right. Yes, sir. Were you... I mean, if you want to complete your statement, you can. Oh, I think right. I wasn't there personally, but again, uh, we had multiple officers there who gave a, a statement yeah, about what happened. I, I, All right. You can testify to what you saw and what you, uh, okay? That's I what I was asking. All right. So a lot of times in these type reports, you have one person saying one thing and one person saying another, correct? Yes, sir. And so you don't have a way of telling who actually ran a red light or who didn't. Well, based on the damage, also, you, you could put that into um, into evaluation when you... All right. And we saw a picture of your diagram, correct? Yes, sir. And it showed a T-bone. Yes, sir. Is this... But looking at that, you can't tell whether somebody pulled out in front of somebody or whether somebody ran into somebody that was already into the intersection, can you? In other words, you can't tell by looking at your diagram who was at fault. You can't. You can't tell, no. Right, you can't. No. Okay. And other than anything else here today, basically, it's still a reported accident. Yes. You don't know who's at fault, who did what, other than you arrived on the scene and filled out what you were supposed to do. So when we're doing a police report, we again, we, we analyze everything, we investigate everything, and one of the main things that I, me personally as an officer, I, I look at the damages, the position of the damages, yes. and a lot of times it could tell you um, based on the damages and where the angle is, what and, happened. And there are a lot of things you can look at and all that, but basically it's still something that you didn't witness. No. Right. Okay. I don't have any further questions, Your Honor. All right. State anything further? Very briefly, Your Honor. Officer Raymond, before creating that diagram, uh, did you or did you not gather any information to create? Yes, sir. I gathered um, information from, again, Officer Cogdell, who was the primary unit. Um, um, pretty much, who, again, he initiated the traffic stop, and he literally was a couple of feet behind the vehicle when it happened. You haven't, yeah. I'm sorry? Getting into hearsay again. Why don't you all come up, please? Yes, sir.
respond and uh, investigate track accidents is mm -hmm. to uh, diagram something you can do at the end of your investigation or the day. No, you do the, the diagram. Everything you do pertains to an accident report, you do it at the end. Again, you, you investigate. I, I, I investigate. I see what the damages are. I speak to the drivers on scene. And then from there, based on what they say, I go ahead and do the report, including the diagram. Thank you, Officer. Your Honor, uh, no further questions or no redirect, further redirect by the state. Uh, anything further, Mr. Bonds? Okay. All right. May Officer Raymond be permanently or temporarily excused as a witness? Your Honor, permanently excused. Okay, Officer Raymond, thank you for your patience with us. I'm going to permanently excuse you as a witness, so you're free to go about your usual duties and advocation. Just don't discuss your testimony with anybody except the attorneys in this case, okay? All right, call your next witness. Your Honor, it's going to be 10 Ryan. Uh, send back with us. Based off all those came back with us before the you have to speak up. You have to speak up. We, we couldn't hear you at all. <laughs> Trailed off. All right, so. Your Honor, this time the state will be tendering certified copies of conviction and self-authenticating documents of Mr. Shannon Stilwell. I mean, what's the state? Sorry. You approach when you get a chance. Um, yeah, we can do it right now.
Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, at this time, the state would like to tender um, a few exhibits um, related to Act 98. Um, first, Your Honor, the state would like to tender state's exhibit 30Q, pursuant to OCGA 901. This is a certified copy of conviction of Mr. Shannon Bernard Jackson under indictment 19SC. 173-371, where Mr. Jackson pled guilty to the lesser included fleeing and attempting to elude a police officer. He pled to hit and run, obstruction of law enforcement officer, expired or no license on person. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'll uh, I'll note your objection and uh, notice your continuing objection, and I'll overrule it. Okay. And possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. He pled to this indictment on January twenty first, two thousand and twenty, where he received a. Okay. You have to speak Just, up, sir. You are. The sentence is relevant and it's not necessary for part of the uh, certified disposition. You're right, and we can withdraw All that right. portion of it. I'll sustain the objection, sir. Thank you. And, and that was states, I'm sorry, ma'am. So I said, didn't hear your question, Your Honor. That was states what? I'm sorry. 30 Q, Your Honor. All right. States 32 Q is admitted, um, and the uh, court will note the objection, our continued objection. Thank you, Your Honor. And as it results to Act 98 and Act 55 within Count 1, where Mr. Stilwell is charged with possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, the basis of those of, of that act is also followed by what the state is going to tender as State's Exhibit 33Q. 31Q. Uh, granted, sir, and uh, but I'm gonna overrule your objection to this. I'm gonna overrule your objection to this admissibility now. Which is indictment 10SC 87662, where this is for Mr. Shannon Stilwell, also known as Shannon Jackson, where he pled guilty to participation in criminal street gang activity, guilty to burglary, and guilty to criminal damage to property in the second degree. And he pled in September 19, 2013. Also as a basis is State's Exhibit 32Q, which is... You know, I and, uh, I and uh, I'll overrule the objection. Under indictment 11SC 98860.0 where he pled guilty to burglary on June 2nd, 2011. <clears throat> Next, we have State's Exhibit 33Q, which is certified copy of conviction for Shannon Stilwell, 
In case number 13SC, 121-320, where he pled guilty to possession of marijuana. Granted, sir, I will read objection. That's his admissibility. With intent to distribute. And then you're also, also a basis we're going to, um, what has already been admitted, which was State's Exhibit 60G, which is a certified copy of conviction on 15SC 140132. Your Honor, I believe this is, this is already admitted. Yeah, 60G's already been admitted. And I'm just noting again that that was the basis, Your Honor. That's argument. Was already been admitted. That's argument. Okay, so. Okay. And that concludes the state's presentation of Act 98, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Okay. Call your next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Trontavia Stevens. All right. Summon Mr. Trontavia Stevens, please. All right, Mr. Stevens, good morning, sir. Sir, if you could please approach the witness stand. Once you get there, if you would turn and face our name, be sworn as a witness before you sit down, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. 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 S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S. Good morning, Mr. Stevens. Good morning. How are you? I'm okay. Mr. Stevens, would you please tell the jury how old you are? I'm 30 years old. And did you grow up here in Atlanta? Yes. Where did you go to high school? I went to South Atlanta High School. And when you were growing up, what part of Atlanta did you live in? Off Cleveland Avenue. How long did you stay off Cleveland Avenue? Um, that's my only address. Okay. So you still live there? Yes. And did you grow up with siblings in your home? Yes, I had two older brothers. So are you the youngest of all of your yes. siblings? Yes. <clears throat> While you were in high school, would you tell the jury whether you participated in any extracurricular activities or anything of that nature? No, I didn't. You didn't play football? No. And as a kid or as a teenager, did you have any desire to be anything in particular when you grew up? Yes, I always wanted to be a chef. You wanted to be a chef? Yes. Did you ever pursue that dream? No. Now, did you finish high school? You said you went to South Atlanta High School? No, I didn't finish high school. What grade did you finish? 10th. Now, why did you leave high school when you did? Um, bad grades, and I was expelled. I was expelled, too. Do you remember why you were expelled? Um, Fighting and lack of attendance. Did you go on to get your GED? Um, I started, I actually uh, had one more course to pass, and that's math. Right. And are you still working on that? <clears throat> yes. Do you work now? Yes. What type of work do you do? Um, um, control, traffic control, and I'm in school um, where I recently graduated. I got my CDL license. So are you using your CDL license as well? So um, I, I passed my test Friday. This was supposed to be my week to go look for work, but you, yeah, I'm here. But you're here. All right. We appreciate you being here. Now, you
question, Your Honor. I'll sustain it instead of being overbroad. Why don't you just rephrase it, please? Yes, Your Honor. When you left high school, did you know that you wanted to be a doctor? No. Did you stay at home and take care of family members? I had two kids at the time, but no, no, I didn't stay at home. Did you uh, have any way to make money during that time? No. Did you make any money during that time after you graduated from high school? I never graduated from high school. I'm sorry, you're right. Forgive me and thank you for that correction. After you left high school, did you make money at some point before you started what you're currently working towards? Um, no. I basically was trying to find my like adult self. Now you said you did not make any money. Is that legally you didn't make any money or you didn't make any money in any way whatsoever? I didn't make any money. Were there any particular people that you found your core group of friends while you were in high school? People that I grew up with from my neighborhood. And when you left high school, are these the same people that you continue to associate with? Yes, for the most part. And as a general matter, when you first left high school, would you tell the jury, if you can recall, uh, what types of things that you did outside of school and outside of your home, if anything at all, with this group of friends? Um, we, we often hung at the neighborhood park. What's the name of that park? Cleveland Avenue Park. Cleveland Avenue Park. Where exactly is Cleveland Avenue Park located? On Cleveland Avenue. Where we are on Cleveland Avenue. Give us any other reference that you can think of. So it's connected to Cleveland Avenue Elementary School. Is there any other name that you have used or that your friends have used to refer to Cleveland Avenue Park? Yes. Would you tell the jury what that is? The park. Have you ever called it Cleveland Avenue Park? The, the park? Have you ever called Cleveland Avenue Park, Cleveland Avenue Park? No, I just said the park. While you were a teenager and a young adult, did you ever get involved in any games? Yes. Tell the jury if you were the first game that you got involved with. Um, first game that I was involved with was Rock Crew. Now, would you tell the jury what, and for the court reporter's sake, would you spell walk? R-O-C, C-R-E-W. Thank you. And what does rock stand for? Raised on Cleveland. Now, were you the only member of Rock Crew, or were there other members of Rock Crew besides yourself? Yes. Yes, there were other members? Yes. Do you know about how many people were members of Rock Crew when you first joined? No. Were there more than three? Yes. Around what time in your life did you join Rock Crew? Um, how old were you? You want to grab one from the MP? I'm not sure what that was, Judge, but it was not the witness. I don't know what it was either. Tell the Jew, would you like for us to hold on? Page, hold on one second. Okay, all right. There's Lynch getting on Zoom. Lynch. Okay, all right. Huh? Caps call, I'm saying. Huh? 
she's going to take she, him. Yeah, she cool. Take him off. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, we can just, hey, um, Wes, just go ahead and uh, disconnect him. Just disconnect him. All right. We're good. Thank, Thank you, madam. You. Okay, all right. About how old were you when you first joined Rockford? I don't call it at that age, probably 15, 14. 14 or 15? Yeah. And who was it, if anybody at all, that first introduced you to Rockford? <clears throat> so, um, that person is deceased, and per the family wishes, I mean, they was like, can I not speak on the deceased? I understand. I appreciate that. And how about this? Um, without giving their full legal name, are you able to tell the jury the nickname? Yes. Would you tell the jury the nickname of the person? His name is Boo. Spell that for the court. Boo, B O O. Now, how old? <laughs> was Boo when he introduced you to Rockford? I, I really don't know what that is now. Fair enough. Was he older than you or around your same age? Yes, he was older than So was he your friend or friends of any particular members of your family? Like when you first were introduced to Rock Crew through him, was he, did you know him personally? Or were you introduced to him through someone? Um, I'm trying to recall. They've been so long ago. Uh, I'm trying to remember how I actually met him. So yeah, it had to be like me you knowing someone he knew. Okay. Did Rock Crew have any particular way that they identify themselves or that you all identify yourselves? Like, did you make yourselves known to the community that you were rock crew? Um, it really didn't have to because all of us was raised on Cleveland, and that's what it stood for, raised on Cleveland. Did you all do some things that were not as rock did you all do some things that was not legal at, as a rock crew? So it was alleged that rock crew committed the crimes in the neighborhood. Myself personally, I had a criminal record at the time. So yes, because I was a rock crew and I had a criminal record, so yes. Now I'm asking um, a specific question now, okay? <clears throat> Did you and other members of Rock Crew ever commit any crimes together? No. Never? No. Okay. And are you aware of other members of Rock Crew committing crimes? I'm, I'm aware that allegedly they was committing crimes. Everyone had a record at the time. Or like some of us had a record at the time. Members of Rock Crew. Yes. yes. And they had, do they have those records and get those records while they were operating as rock crew? Yes, people called cases as when it was rock crew. What kind of cases did they catch as rock crew? So, um, my childhood friend, he had a burger. Which, what was the name of your childhood friend? Um, Jason Scott. Basis. Yeah. Y'all come on up, please.
Write it down, right now, sir? Write what down? Um, the question I have for my opinion. I don't know who she can answer. Okay. Okay. Let me find out. I don't know about it. I got you.
So the, the question is going to be answered by time. So they're going to ask. I was just going to write something about my time. Uh, you can't do it right now. Okay, no problem. So you do need to make No, no problem. <laughs> Thank you for waiting, Mr. Stevens. Going back to the members of Rockford, would you tell the jury the names of some of your um, accomplices who were members of Rockford, some of the people who were members of Rockford at the time that you were a member of Rockford? some of the names that was so of course my brothers what were your brothers names? Uh, but DeMario first and last name DeMario Stevens DeMontanero Stevens and were they members of Rock Crew before you were a member of Rock Crew? <clears throat> so we actually all just at the same time. Joined Rock Crew at the same time? Yes. All right. Would you tell the jury other members of Rock Crew? Um, so 
Like I was saying, my childhood friend, Jason, he was a member. Jason, what was that last name? Scott. All right. What were the other, and let me back up just a bit if you don't mind. Um, I know that you've given your friend's family assurances that you won't be speaking on him, but in order to establish certain facts for the jury, um, I'm going to have to speak on. Jackson, these are not okay. questions here, huh? And ask you questions. Well, I don't know what we're saying, Jackson. What did he say? What did he say? Do you want him to talk to me? Yes. Just wait five minutes. Okay. Based upon our rent conference, uh, based upon that, I'm gonna I'm gonna sustain the objection. Okay. Sustain your So um <coughs> no, I'm gonna overrule the objection. Um okay, so Mr. Stevens, you're gonna have to answer the questions, okay? All right. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Stevens, uh, Boo, was that person's name Quentin Porter? Yes. Uh, and was that person the person who founded Rock Crew? I'm not sure. Um, it was an older guy, so I don't know who found him. Was he considered the leader of Rock Crew during the time that you were a member of Rock Crew? So it really wasn't no form like leader. It was. <laughs> Older guys, so so if you want to say that he was one of the older guys, yes, he was one of the older guys. Uh, was he able to tell you or younger guys what to do as Rockford? No, no one gave me any orders. What kinds of things did you and other members of Rock Group do on a daily basis together? Um. Like I said, we often hung at Cleveland Avenue Park. That was like the hangout. Um, we shot basketball, gambled on basketball, um, jump shots. Um, we shot dice. We smoked weed, um, drunk liquor. We clubbed. Yeah. Those you things. Sell drugs? Not at the time. I wasn't selling drugs. When you say at the time, what time is it that you're referring to? Because I was initially arrested um, in 2015 for possession of marijuana. That's when I was selling drugs. Other members of Rock Crew, <clears throat> did other members of Rock Crew, to your knowledge, engage in selling drugs? Not to my knowledge. I mean, uh, it was a person you can purchase marijuana from at the park for like recreational use, but. Right. Was that person a rock crew member? No. Nah. <laughs> no. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, um. We was young. We didn't know where to get no marijuana from. So guys would come to the park knowing that we want to smoke weed. So those guys when like rock crew or like hanging with us on a daily basis. They were just older guys trying to make some money off the new guys. Mr. Stevens, before today, <coughs> did I or any other member of the DA's office attempt to speak with you? and just discuss with you what questions we'd ask of you or things of that nature? So, yes, but no one explained to me the second part that you said. It was just meet somewhere, and I was trying to ask my lawyer to understand what was this meeting pertaining to. And you're saying that no one, not even myself, prior to you coming in here today, ever told you we just want to talk with you about the questions we're going to ask you? Oh, yes, ma'am. You told me that yesterday. Okay. Did you agree to talk with me yesterday? My, no, ma'am. My lawyer wasn't present. Do you know or recognize Mr. Brian Steele when you see him? Yes. You see him in the courtroom? Yes. Where is he? Um, to the left of me in front of me. All right. Is he seated next to who is to his right? Um, Jeffrey Williams. All right. And do you know Mr. Keith Adams when you see him? Um, I got familiar with his name yesterday, but yeah, I see him. 
You did talk to them yesterday. Yes. How long did you talk to them? Roughly, um, no more than 10, 13 minutes. Is your testimony that you spoke with them for 10 or 13 minutes? Yes. That's all? Yes. Um, did you agree to speak with me for 10 to 13 minutes? No, not without my lawyer present. Why were you willing to speak with Jeffrey Williams' lawyers for 10 to 13 minutes but not me? I never declined speaking with you. I told you that my lawyer wasn't present. Did I ask you, or were you speaking to your lawyer on the phone when I was asking to speak with you? Yes. And did I ask you to have your lawyer on the phone while we were speaking? No. I didn't ask you that. No. You told, did I ask you You told me that you was going to go over the indictment with me, I mean, the, uh, the plea agreement with me. You never said that uh, you can keep her on the phone while we talk. And is it your testimony that you were never told or asked to three-way or conference call your lawyer while we spoke with you? Is that your testimony today? That you told me that yesterday? That you were never told by me or Investigator Randolph or anyone that you were able to in a three-way or a conference call or even Zoom your lawyer while you were speaking with them. So my lawyer was telling me uh, that she was not going to be able to be with me because she was out of town with her family and that she could sit in with Zoom. Your lawyer told you that she could sit in with Zoom? Yes. And did you ever agree to sit in on a Zoom call and talk to us with your lawyer via Zoom? So, like I was explaining to my lawyer, the time that she was telling me, I actually broke down on the side of the highway. I was on the phone with her all night. I had me and my son in the car, and I was telling her that getting me and my son home safely was, like, the most important thing that I was trying to figure out at the time. Mr. Stevens, during that time that you're referring to, were you not at a football game or a game with your son? So the, I said the initial night, she told me that night. She first told me about it at night time when she caught my phone. Again, so why is it that you were willing to speak with Jeffrey Williams' lawyers and not me? Objection passed. It was not asked. Objection has to be asserted in this characterizing the uh, response from the witness. No mistake. I wanted to speak with objection. Why were you willing to speak with Jeffrey Williams' lawyers and not me? I never declined speaking with you. I told you that my lawyer was in prison when you asked me. Testimony today is that you never declined to speak with me. Stating a sentence. Are you telling the jury that you never declined to speak with me? I'm going to stand your attention. Do you have a tattoo behind your ear that says 75K over 18? Yes. What does that tattoo stand for? Um, it, it was basically manifesting that I reached a certain amount of money before I turned 18. Did you ever tell anyone in the district attorney's office that it was in fact because you did have a certain amount of money when you turned 18? I don't recall. <clears throat> so, do you recall whether you in fact had $75,000 at the time you were 18? I never had $75,000 at the time I was 18. And you don't recall is it your testimony that you just don't remember whether you ever told anybody in the DA's office? That's what that 75 what the judge team has to do. One at a time, please. Okay. Mr. Sharp, what's your objection? Yes. Um, overruled. Next person. Ms. West Same objection. Overruled. Thank you. <laughs>
And so you have no memory of ever telling someone in the district attorney's office that 75K over 18 was a tattoo that you got because you had $75,000 when you were 18 years old. To the formal question and ask the answer. Overruled, Mr. Harvey. Overruled, Mr. Harvey. Yes, Your Honor. I couldn't just show the biggest who and what time, I believe, are the predicates to ask that type of question. I have to do it. So, no, sir. You can rephrase it, ma'am. One of us is heading to the last detective. Yes, Your Honor. You are going to have to pose this to that man. Did you, have you ever told me? And investigator felt now that the 75k over 18 was because you had set you got that tattoo because you had $75,000 by the time you were 18 years old. So I don't recall, I don't recall. I, I mean, I, I started getting in trouble when I was 11 years old, so that was roughly 14 15 years ago. I, I don't recall. What things did you talk about with Mr. Adams and Mr. Steele yesterday? What did he say? Um, <clears throat> Mr. Adams asked me, um, where was Chrissy? Um, Mr. Steele was explaining to me that It's a chance that I probably won't take the stand today, so having you sit out here from 8.30 to 5.30 is like um, not good because I had a job, I got a job, and I was trying to make it work. And did you all speak at all about what questions you might be asked on the scene? So he showed me some images. The question I'm asking you, is did you all talk at all about the questions that you might be asked on the stand? Um, if I'm not like wording his exact words, um, he said these images may be shown to you tomorrow. Mr. Stevens, I appreciate that part. I'm asking you specifically, did you all, did you, Mr. Steele and Mr. Adams, talk to you, talk at all about the questions that you might be asked on the stand? First off, how about this? Could you answer either in the affirmative or in the negative, either yes or no, and then give your explanation? Could you do that for us, please? Yes. So did you, Mr. Adams and Mr. Steele, talk at all about the questions that you might be asked while you were on the stage? Yes, Mr. Steele showed me some images, and he said that you may be asked about these images. And is that the only thing you all discussed when it came to questions you might be asked on the stand. Yes. Now, did anyone at any time, you know, tell you how you might want to answer anything, anything of that nature? No. And when you were shown the pictures that may be shown to you, while you were on the stand. What was the conversation around those pictures? Um, so, Chrissy was sitting right next to me. She's Chrissy. my attorney. Okay. Chrissy, Ms. Gladden. Chrissy, Ms. Gladden, I'm sorry. Did yes. Is she sitting somewhere back there waving at you right now? Yes. All right, go ahead. So, Ms. Gladden told Mr. Steele that she has that file and she would pull it up for me and that was the end. Were there any more communications, any other conversations about the pictures you might be shown or any other questions that might be asked? Um, I'm going to see if you're going to be called and try to get your excuse for it. Anything else? No. Other than Mr. Porter and your two brothers, would you please tell the jury and Mr. Scott, please tell the jury other members of Rock Crew who were members during the time that you were a member. So, so, so you want me to name everyone that I like, grew up with, basically? I would like for you to name for the jury 
other people who were members of rock group during the time of you are known. I mean, are you gonna like tell me when to stop or like is there a certain amount of people you need to name anything? Please just name some that just some of them. So just name some people. All the ones you remember who were members of Rock Everyone? Mr. Stevens. Could you please name the members of Rock Crew who were members by you or a member? I probably wouldn't even be able to name everyone. Name the ones you can name. So uh Again, I probably won't be able to name everyone first and last name. So I got my next door neighbor, we can work together. His name's Marvin. I need you to just name the members of Rockford. Not friends, not people you grew up with necessarily. Just if you just give the names of the people who were members. If you could, what do you object to Yes, Your Honor, I'm asking to make certain that we are, uh, that we are, that the answer is responsive. I'm asking for members of Rock Crew, and because he's referencing certain issues. Yes. Okay. So I'm asking to make sure that we're clear. I understand, ma'am. Would you name for the jury members of Rock Crew who are members of Rock Crew, why you are a member? Yes, so I started referencing certain things because that was... I'm sorry. Can I need you to be responsive. I need you to, you can explain afterwards. Okay. You just name the people. That's the thing. I'm, I'm trying to use my memory of, like, where people stayed at on my street to, like, help me, help me, basically. I appreciate you, though. But do you, let me start by asking this. Do you remember the people who were members of Rock Crew while you were a member of Rock Crew? I mean, that was, that was 10, 11 years ago. You're not answering my question. I can try. I'm asking you if you remember the names of the people. Not by heart, man. You don't remember any of them? Yes, I'm trying to, I'm, man, I'm trying to, uh, like, I almost can't remember. Like I said, I stayed in the same house for 30 years. So I can almost remember where everyone stayed at, and I can, I'm, I'm trying to put the house with the name. So that's why I started with my neighbor. And like, that's where I was, that's the direction I was headed in. Okay. All right. So, so Marvin, your name? yeah. Who else? Um, there was another Jason. Um, so I'm just like basically going up and down the street because. All us raised on the street. That's off Cleveland, so that's what made us rock crew. So, um, um, of course, Quentin. Um, his little brothers. He had two younger brothers. Um, Dang, this, this life's going to be hard. <laughs> Are those the only people you remember? They're like straight off top. I mean, like. Did you ever talk with members of Rock Crew about uh, things that you all did that were not exactly legal? And I have. I don't know what to call them. I mean, I can you like, I don't understand the question. Can you say it again? Did you ever talk with members of the Rock Crew about the things that you did, you and other members of Rock Crew, that were not exactly legal? Yes. What types of things did you all talk about? So, 
shooting dice wasn't technically illegal. We had conversations about the dice game after they was over with. Was shooting dice the only thing that was not legal that you all discussed that you all did? Again, that I can recall. That's the only thing you remember? You have to say yes or no. Yes. <clears throat> Do you recall whether members of Rock Crew stole ATM machines? I'm familiar with the allegations, yes. How are you familiar with the allegations? It's like, it's like <laughs> worldwide televised. So, not worldwide, but it was like televised and so. stuff. I was in juvenile uh, detention facility when those allegations were like being thought about, being talked about. So, yes, I was familiar with it. Right. Did you ever hear members of Rock talking about it? No, I wasn't here. Y'all don't know it's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me, let me rule an objection. The objection to the old rule, okay? <laughs> so, yes, you may answer the question. Old rule, sir. So I was in junior and other people who was coming in fresh from off the street was like mentioning, hey, they're saying that guys from the neighborhood are responsible for these. That's hearsay. I asked you that. I asked you a very, very specific question. So if you would please answer this question I'm asking you. Did you ever hear members of Rock Crew talking about the ATM deaths? Oh, no. Never. Me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Hold on, Mr. Steele. What's the answer? Tell the judge your answer. No. And did you ever discuss the ATM deaths with any members of Rock Crew? I don't recall. <clears throat> did you ever discuss any members of Rock Crew's drug sales? No. What's the base for your objection? Let me, let me, what's your, what's the base for your objection, sir? Foundation of time. I'll sustain this to foundation, okay? You can rephrase, madam, okay? Yes, Judge. All right. What year was it that you recall first being an active or being a member of Rock? You said you were around a certain age. What year was that? I'll rule that objection. That means you can answer. Oh. <clears throat> I had been about sixth grade. So whatever. What are you about? Eleven or twelve in the sixth grade? Would you tell the jury what year you were on the first beat? or being a member of Rock. I'm trying to count. I'm kind of bad with math. That's why I ain't passed the math part of my GD yet. Let me ask you a different question. Why you count? Count them both at the same time. That's okay with you. No, no. One thing at a time. One thing at a time. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you want to be here? Do I want to be here today? No. Um, I'm all over the objection, Mr. Matthews. So I'm sorry, there was an What was your answer? No. Why not? Because uh, I have a new career path that I'm trying to pursue. I've been filing applications, um, kind of trying to put all this behind me and move forward. And I paid for my uh, CDL training school out of my pocket, so I'm kind of trying to make that money back. So, do you, you don't mind testifying? Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Okay. Right. And you, you don't mind testifying truthfully? No. Okay. So, if you would, give us a rough estimate of the year you first joined or were a member of Rock Crew. Were you a member in 2010? If I was in sixth grade, I'm trying to put what year I was in sixth grade. How old were you in 2010? I was trying to do my math. Don't do the math. Let me ask you this. What year were you born? 
Thirteen. Yep. Ninety-three. Two thousand and three. Thirteen. Two thousand thirteen is twenty. Twenty. Now we back up three years from thirteen. That puts us at two thousand ten, which makes you about seventeen. He's going too fast. I'm so sorry. Slow it down. Overruled. So in 2010, if you're about 17 years old, um, who's a member of Rock Crew with you during that time? You just gave me a lot of numbers. No, just around the age of 17. Who is a member of Rock Crew with you during that time? My older brothers. The same people I gave you, the same name they gave you. Okay. And those are still the only ones you remember, even at, at 17? Yeah. Okay. Now, as a member of Rock Crew, did you also claim affiliation with the National Blood Gang? Yes. How was it that you, and, and Quentin Porter, what role did he have, if any at all, in your affiliation with the Bloods? No. None? No. None whatsoever? No. Okay. So how then did you become, or were you all affiliated with the Bloods? How then did I become, or you all, or me? We can start with you, and then go to other members of the <coughs> So when I was in a juvenile facility, um, gang-related activity was going on all through there. How do you define gang-related activity? What do you um, mean by that? Saying you're in a gang, um, hand signs, um, handshakes. And is that a way or a means for people to identify themselves as being in a particular gang? Yes. What were some of the hand signs that you observed in the juvenile detention center? Um, just at the time, because everything was new and we was like so young, I mean, I can't explain it. I can show you. Sure. You don't have to give me your hand. No, you don't have to give me your hand. No, 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 no. You don't have to show the jury with your hand. I didn't say handshake, I said hand sign. So you don't have to show the jury with your own hand. Um, you don't know, I'm in no way, like, torn with this judicial system. I'm not, I mean, like, that, I'm not trying to, like, play. You know, just uh, for the record. But, yeah. I need, I need another hand. Are you telling the jury right now that you're unable to show hand signs without someone else's hand? So my my initial response was a, a handshake. I, I said, there's this handshake because we were so young, that's the only thing that we was doing. Okay. Yeah. You also mentioned hand signs. Do you remember saying that? But you asked me. Wait, just let me ask you. Remember saying hand signs? Yes. Okay. So, did you see hand signs in the juvenile detention center? It was new. I mean, like, gang and stuff was new back then. Okay. So, finish telling the jury what your definition of gang activity is. Um. Hand movements. I'm sorry. Hand movements, uh, handshakes, uh, colors. Um, being around people who's 
doing the same hand shapes, wearing the same colors and hand movements. What gang activity did you observe as it relates to particular gangs while you were in the juvenile detention center? <coughs> I understand my question because I can rephrase. You can rephrase. What gangs did you see activity of while you were in the juvenile detention center? Um, the one that I was familiar with, the blood. What particular blood gang <coughs> did you see activity of in the juvenile detention center? Cash and foundation. <coughs> um, I'll sustain the objection. You can you can lay a little more foundation, madam. How did you know that they were blood? Um, they were saying it. Did they say what kind of bloods they were? Again, uh, gang stuff was like new. I was in juvenile, like, it wasn't what it is, like, then, I mean. Since you were in juvenile, you were under, where, is it fair to say you were under the age of 17? Nah, because I was uh, sentenced to a sentence in juvenile that you can see the age of 17. So you were either 17 or young? Nah, you, I actually could have been older. I could have been 21. Like, How old were you? When I first got arrested, I was 11. I was 11 when I was first introduced to the juvenile system. Yes. Okay, when you were 11. Thank you. All right. Now let's talk about when you were 17. At 17, did you um, claim any particular game besides rock? I was rock crew. Just rock, rock crew. Did you claim any affiliation with any blood game? Yes, I claim, yes. What blood gang did you claim affiliation with? We were just saying blood and crips. I'm asking what, which one, which, are you aware of particular blood gangs? Yes, yes. Would you tell the jury what blood gangs you are aware of? Hit a jury which play game I'm aware of. Um, I'm familiar with, uh, I'm aware of. Uh, SMM. What is SMM? Uh, it's a blood game. I know. Okay. What does it stand for? Um, sex one word. Okay. And who is its leader? I'm not sure. How are you aware of? How am I aware of the name? Of sex one word. From hearing about it type stuff. Mm -hmm. From my like, hearing about it and stuff. From hearing about it? Yeah. From whom? Who I heard about it from? Yeah. Uh, it's not no like particular person that I heard it from. It's like I know I heard about it though. So what all do you know about sex money? It's a blood game. Is there anything else that you know about sex money? Not like officially, no. Did you ever do anything to become a member of Sex Money Month? No. Did you ever publicly claim Sex Money Month? I don't recall. While you were hearing about things like Sex Money Murder, did you ever learn or 
believe that harm would come to people who did things like falsely claim sex money murder? Objection, Your Honor, here today. I'm going to rule that, sir. What? Oh, one more time, I'm sorry. While you were hearing things about sex money murder, did you ever hear or come to believe that harm would come to people who falsely claim sex money murder? Sustained. Do you have any knowledge whether harm could come to a person who falsely claims sex money murder? No, not personally. Did you ever hear that harm could come to a person who falsely claims? That's an almost standing objection. Your Honor, it's not for the truth of the matter asserted. It's for its impact on him. Okay, all right. I'll reverse my decision. You can answer that. Did you ever? An instruction, and this is not the Mr. 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 Harvey, Mr. Harvey, please sit down, sir. I'm going to overrule your objection. Okay. All right. Did you ever hear that harm could come to a person who falsely claimed sex money murder? Who said that? Who said that's an answer? Mr. Harvey. Okay. All right. That has been asked and answered, Miss Love. Your Honor, he did not answer that particular one. He answered. Um, Hang on. Hold on. He has answered that question, ma'am. Yeah. Did you believe it when you heard it? Oh. Did you believe? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a, Mr. Steele, I'm going to overrule that objection. Did you believe it when you heard it? That somebody harmed harm me? That harm could come to a person who falsely claimed sex money murder. Yes. Are you aware of any of the hand signs used to proclaim sex money murder? Yes. Do are you able to perform or to demonstrate any of these hand signs without the use of somebody else's hand? Yes. Would you please Show the jury one hand sign signifying sex money murder. What does that mean? Blood. Okay. And what are you describing for the court reporter to say? Describe how you just curled your fingers. Dang. I uh, made a circle on my um my pointy finger and my thumb. I made another circle about my middle finger. And are you familiar with any other signs that signify sex money murder? Yes. Would you describe it before you show us? What other signs are you familiar with? Um, would I describe before I show it? Uh, a smaller circle. What else? Uh, and, uh, And, and not curling my index finger this time. Are those the only ones that you're familiar with? Yes. Would you show the jury the things that you just described? What is that? A small, uh, a, a lower place B. And what does that stand for? Um, blood. Okay. And what was the other one that you described? Or was that the only one? Uh, I described a capitalized B. Are those the only two hand signs you're familiar with that are related to sex money murder? Yeah, that I don't call those. 
Ms. Lowe, before you continue, I'll posit your next question. Um, we've been going a little bit, and it might be appropriate, given the hour at this point, to have a break for lunch. Yes, sir. Uh, and let the jury also have a period of respite. Um, okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, how about some lunch at this point in time? All right, let's do this. Um, it's, it's 12, almost 12.20 at this point in time. Let's recess until 1.30. And... Um, just before we leave, as, as uh, has been indicated uh, by my ad nauseum admonitions, uh, please do not talk about them, anything that you have uh, heard in the courtroom consistent with the court's admonitions I've given you. Um, if you should go out, leave your notepads in, the, in your basket. Uh, and um, unless you have any other inquiry of me, um, We'll excuse you for lunch and see you back at 1.30, okay? All right, as soon as I count for all of you, we'll go ahead and call you back out, all right? Anything for me? All right, okay. All right, we're going to be in recess, all right? All rise. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Uh, Mr. Stevens, I'm going to release you for lunch. You need to come back at 1.30, sir. Please don't discuss your testimony. Anybody except the attorneys in this case, okay? No. All right. Um, counsels, I have a request from uh, Ms. Weaver. When you object, let one person object at one time. Let me rule, because if you object in the middle of somebody else's objection, uh, it's very hard for her to take down uh, everyone's uh, thoughts, okay? So, and before the state's done with their objection. Yeah. Yeah. See, see what you're doing? See, exa that's exactly what, exactly what I was talking about, Mr. Uh, Court judge. <laughs> on the issue of what? On the issue of when or one person to object. If we're all in questions being drawn, we all have a, a requirement and responsibility for our clients to stand up and immediately object. Now, I agree that we should wait for the court's instructions to be pointed out or singled out in terms of who should now speak. But, Your Honor, I, I don't think I need to wait on Mr. Steele to see if he's going to make an objection on Mr. Sharp. If I think that something is... Didn't say, didn't say anything about that. It's just one at a time, okay? I'm not saying you don't have the right to object. Okay. All right, so... It's just that, just as a matter of politeness and a, and a way for Miss Weaver to take down everybody's objections, because once she got to identify the speaker, yes, and then she's got to go ahead and and then um, attribute it, that objection to that particular individual. But when multiple people start talking, so if you know if you all have an objection, that's fine. Just wait till one's done, and I'll acknowledge you, and we can go take it from there. Okay. All right. Okay. Unless we have anything else, I'll see you all back at uh, 1.30 for a continuation of this afternoon's festivities, all right? Okay, all right, we're in recess. I'm familiar with the allegations, yes. How are you familiar with the allegations? It's like, it was like worldwide televised. So, not worldwide, but it was like televised and stuff. I was in juvenile uh, detention facility.
when those allegations were like being brought about, being talked about. So, yes, I was familiar with it. Did you ever hear members of Rock talking about it? No, you're interested. Your Honor, no, it's not. <laughs> All right, let me, let me rule on objection. The objection is all ruled, okay? <laughs> so, yes, you may answer the question. All rules, sir. So, I was in juvenile, and other people who was coming in fresh from off the street was, like, mentioning, hey, they're saying that guys from your neighborhood are responsible no, for these. I, that's your sir. I asked you a very, very specific question, so if you would please answer this question I'm asking. I'm just, Did you ever hear members of Rock Group talking about the ATM desk? Oh, no. Never. Me? No. Not, hold on, Mr. Steele. What's the answer? Tell me your answer. No. All right. And did you ever discuss the ATM desk with any members of Rock Group? I don't recall. <clears throat> Did you ever discuss any members of Rock Crew's drug sales? What's the base for your objection? Let me, let me, what's your, what's the base for your objection, sir? Foundation. I'll sustain this as the foundation, okay? You can rephrase, madam, okay? Yes, All right. What year was it that you recall first being an active or being a member of Rock? You about sixth grade. So whatever. What did you write? Eleven or twelve in the sixth grade? Did you tell the jury what year you remember first becoming or being a member of Rock? I'm trying to count. I'm kinda of bad with math. That's why I ain't passed the math part of my GD yet. Let me ask you a different question while you count. Mm -hmm. And on the most at the same time, that's okay with you. No, no, one thing at a time, one thing at a time, I'm sorry. Okay. Do you, you want to be here today? Do I want to be here today? No. Um, I'm over with the objection, Mr. Matthews. So I'm sorry, there was an objection. No. Why Because uh, I have a new career path that I'm trying to pursue. I've been filing applications. Um, kind of trying to put all this behind me and move forward. And I paid for my uh, CDL training school out of my pocket, so I'm kind of trying to make that money back. So do you, you don't mind testifying? Is that fair to say? No. Okay. And you, you don't mind testifying truthfully? No. Okay. So if you would, give us a rough estimate of where you first joined or were a member of Rock Group? Were you a member in 2010? If I was in sixth grade, I'm trying to put what year I was in sixth grade. How old were you in 2010? I was trying to do my math. Don't do the math. What year were you born? 1993. 1993. So... Yeah, in 2013, would that make about 20? 2013. 2013. 2013 is 20. 20. Now, if we back up three years from 13, that puts us at 2010, which makes you about 17. He's going too fast. <laughs> <laughs> Overruled. So in 2010, you're about 17 years old. Um, who's the member of Rock Crew with you during that time? He 
You just gave me a lot of numbers. No, it's round age 17. Who is a member of Rockford with you during the house? My older brothers, the same people I gave you, the same names I gave you. And those are still the only ones you remember, even at 17? Yeah. Okay. Yes. How was it that you, and, and Quentin Porter, what role did he have, if any at all, in your affiliation with the Bloods? No. None? No. No, what's that? No. So how then did you become, or were you all affiliated with the Bloods? How then did I become, or you all, or me? Did it start with you, and then go to other members of <clears throat> So when I was in a juvenile facility, um, gang-related activity was going on all through there. How do you define gang related activity? What do you um, mean by that? Saying you in the gang, um, hand signs, um, handshakes. And is that a way or a means for people to identify themselves as being in a particular gang? Yes. What were some of the hand signs? that you observed in the juvenile detention center? Um, just at the time, because everything was new and we was like so young. I mean, I can't explain it. I can show you. You don't have to give me your hand. <laughs> Well, this is a good time. We're going to take an actual break right now. But you know why? Because on the other side, we're going to have your questions. And we have a lot of them. I have it on my screen open from YouTube, from Facebook, from Twitter. Actually, you can text them to us at Let Law and Crime Network, uh, at Kathy Russell, our executive producer, or at me, at Kenny Biden on Twitter. And we will answer your questions. Stay with us. We are at Law and Crime, and we are at a very interesting trial.
Welcome back to Law and Crime. We are still following the racketeering trial out of Atlanta for Jeffrey Williams, who's also known as the rapper Young Thug, and also his five co-defendants who are on trial with him. The courtroom is now on their lunch break, and we'll be back at approximately 1.30, which means our live Q&A, our questions and answers, starts now. And my legal experts are Brian Buckmeyer and Joe Richardson. So don't forget to continue to ask and post your questions on YouTube, on our YouTube chat, on social media, all of our social media. And even you can uh, text them to uh, our producers and at Law Crime Network. Uh, on uh, X Twitter, so our experts can answer them. So let's begin with the questions right here from Purple Dinosaur, Brian Buckmeyer, and he's been following the case because I watched uh, you on the air yesterday uh, with Bob Bianchi, and he says, talking about Trontavious, uh, or Tick, or Slug as he's known, how will the witness's forgetfulness impact how the jury perceives him? So, Purple Dinosaur, I'll answer your question directly, but then I, I think the question is also going to be a little, little different. I think if a jury is looking at a witness and they, they believe them to be forgetful, either one of two I things. Get, either yeah. the witness is being evasive and untruthful, and so they'll side with whatever side uh, yeah, works well. along with that untruthfulness, or they'll just kind of discredit all the information they're giving because why rely on someone who is uh, forgetful? However, I will put an asterisk next to that because who says he's forgetful? I, I tell young attorneys, you're always playing a game of who is the, and I can't curse, so let's say the, the, the donkey's backside, right? And if you ask questions in a certain way, uh, very aggressively or not allowing a witness to answer the question, like do the math when you were in the, in the sixth grade, right. and the person is telling you, I failed the math part of the GED. It's going to take me I'm a second so, so to, to figure to this me. out. Yeah. Right. Like, is a person being forgetful, or are you just not allowing a person who clearly has a lower, potentially IQ, and I don't mean it disrespectfully, and a lower educational level, they just need a second to get where you are. So I'm not sure if he's being forgetful, or if the prosecutor just is a little too pushy and not giving him enough string or properly leading him down the path. Yeah, and so that brings us to our second question. Joe Richardson, I'm gonna pose this to you, because how does one fulfill the plea deal? This is from Step On It. How does one fulfill the, whatever plea deal they've made while still evading direct questions and not violate said plea deal? That assumes that he's evading questions. And the last question, let's let's start with this, was like, I can show you, but you're gonna have to give me your hand, Madam right. Prosecutor. <laughs> Take it from there, Joe Richardson. Exactly, so he cannot plead the fifth in response to any questions that are related to the things that he actually pled to in writing. So what she needs to do is go to the stuff that he pled to in writing. Start from there. So the way that he, you know, you know, uh, walks the fine line is whether he's playing a game or he's truly simple, you know, the way that these questions are being asked, they are evoking certain answers from him at his level. And she's got to get to him where he is because it's not clear that he's being evasive in a way that would violate his plea deal. His plea deal. I don't know that that's there. And if you thought that it was there as the prosecutor, you would pull out the plea deal and say, you pled to this, this, and this. And why don't you start asking about the crimes that are related to the plea deal? He'd have to answer those a certain way. But he said, he said it. I don't know if he saw Jerry Maguire before, but he said, help me help you. That's what he said to her. Yeah. He said, I can show you this, but give me your hand. Well, she wasn't interested in that, but she asked the question. So she's yeah. got to get where he is. And, and then that's a follow-up, because CBS, Brian uh, Buckmeyer, how does this test my effect as plea? Well, first of all, you got to pull out the plea deal and go through right. the questions you asked in front of the judge on the road to that plea deal with your attorney present that negotiated it. So how does it affect it? It, I mean, the devil's in the details. So it really, and I know we don't have access to all of the details of the plea deal. We only know that he cannot plead the fifth to any crimes that he's already pled guilty to, that he pled guilty to a RICO charge. So I know he must have agreed that there was some sort of criminal enterprise and that there were some acts that he participated in, in further of that and that he's not the only member of that, that enterprise. But no question we've seen so far attacks those three issues. What is the enterprise? Who's in the enterprise? And what overt acts did you do? We're kind of just going around the surface area of, can you tell us who was in the gang in your neighborhood? Or in I, your, or, the, and he's I like, well, my neighbor. And she's like, well, don't tell me about your neighbor. And he's like, but that's how I remember. How, like, So I don't know if he's violating the plea agreement. It looks like he's trying his best, or he's very simple, or maybe he's evading. I don't know. Well, he has to lie to, to violate the plea agreement. That's the first tenet, right? So that gives us to what Silent Al Scribe asked. What, is the, what are the specifics, Joe Richardson, of Tick's 
plea deal in this case. Now, we know he pleaded guilty to RICO, but we don't have the actual deal, do we? Yeah, no, we don't have the actual deal. We know that he was looking at five to 20 years. Um, he had done about two years in custody, so they gave him 10 years, two years, which is already time served, and then the rest on probation. That's what we know that he got. So he's on the street and he talks about, hey, I'm trying to go forward. He's got a truck driver thing. He's like, he wants to get his money back because he's putting the money in related to that. Um, so that's what we know that he's gotten. What he actually pled to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have all of that information, but he is a free man. But again, you know, it's not clear to Brian's point that he has violated uh, anything in terms of how he's testifying so far. Right. As a matter of fact, Brian, let me just add a question before I get to one from our viewer, is that uh, the prosecutor said you refused to meet with me, but he didn't want to meet with her because his lawyer wasn't present yesterday, right? So that doesn't violate, this goes to like a B under silent, I'll scribe. That doesn't violate the plea deal. No. First of all, I, I don't think there, well, I don't know that there's any requirements that he has to speak with the prosecutors whenever they ask to do so. But while he can't plead the fifth to specific questions, it doesn't mean that he's stripped of his right to counsel. We all have a right to counsel. I'll go and speak with you, but my attorney has to be here. You clearly picked a time where my attorney was not here. I so, know it. And I so I said, it. no, like, like, what, like what, what are you asking at this point? Like, do you not understand like, how the criminal justice system works? Is, is this your first time prosecuting a case? Like, it's, it's very confusing. Yeah, yeah. So Joe Richardson, get back with me, with me, uh, asked, how is it legal to just string together a whole bunch of past crimes and convictions to make a RICO case? Now, with that, Joe, let's remind our viewers that RICO was started to get the mafioso, you know, kind of right. like my heritage, and I grew up hearing about them. I'm, <laughs> I'm Italian from New Jersey, you know, I'm proud right. of it. But, you know, right. I'm, I'm like, but I'm not throwing a football at the Giants, but, but that's a whole different story. But how is it legal <laughs> that you throw all these crimes together that were over years and now say, hey, by the way, you're well, well, you know, you can go to prison for life? It was put together to get uh, folks in the mafia. They were sick of getting folks on tax evasion, if that. Uh, and so what it allowed was you could allege a criminal or, uh, enterprise, put a bunch of things together, some of which were timed out on the statute of limitations, some of which you wouldn't testify to separately, uh, and put them all together, allege an enterprise. You do need an underlying crime. It doesn't necessarily have to be as serious as the enterprise is. So it actually is pragmatically put together in order to do that. And there's a federal RICO law, and then many states— um, have their own RICO laws as well, but the theme is similar. Get a whole lot of people together, charge them all uh, on, a, on a conspiracy, and by the way, that's a real good way to get people to plead out. Uh, and that's what has happened in this case. They had dozens of people that they were charging, and most of them have, have pled out. There's only six or seven left. Right, and there's also civil RICO cases that many people use in the civil courts to try to achieve the same results. Anyhow, we have so many questions here. I'm looking at them, but we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll start answering them. Chad's house from YouTube, Broad Springs from YouTube. It's going to keep them going, keep them coming. We're here for you.
coming back and welcome back to Law and Crime. We are answering your questions as the Atlanta courtroom is on their lunch break in the Young Thug trial and we'll be back at approximately 1.30. Now with me and I'm Linda Kenny Bodden are my legal experts, Brian Buckmeyer and Joe Richardson. So don't forget to post your questions to YouTube chat so that our crime legal experts can answer your questions because after all, this is what it's all about. And I'm gonna go to one of them right now, Chad's house. I told you, I promised you Chad's house from YouTube. Is it common for prosecutors to use deals to obtain testimony from folks who are inside the system or facing criminal charges outside of this case to testify? Brian Buckmeyer. I, I mean, in a RICO case, yes. In a gang case, yes. If you're talking about all types of cases, I would say it's not uncommon. Uh, so, so for the nature of this case, yes, because you have to know the ins and outs of a criminal enterprise that you might not be able to, to pierce, but for having those people who are members of it. Yeah, so then let me go to the next one. It's Rod Springs from YouTube, and I'll, and I'll take this one. How is this judge getting away with being so biased? This is a YSL case, and every question being asked is about other people and other clues. Well, you know, this judge has let everybody in that courtroom know he's wearing an Atlanta diamond earring. He's saying, I know about all these gangs here. Nothing's going to get over on me from either the prosecution or the defense. So, you know, is that bias or is he just being tough on both sides here? Uh, we'll see. I mean, I'm a criminal defense attorney. Sometimes I think judges, all judges are biased against us, but that's, you know, that's just me. All right. So let's go now to uh, dozens of destiny from YouTube. And uh, uh, Joe, we kind of answered this, but a dozens of decency says, was Trontavia Stevens, AKA Tix charged before taking the deal? Was it a part of a RICO charge, Joe? Yeah, yeah, he was charged uh, and he made a decision uh, to plead out. And uh, so, you know, that's what he did. Um, and, and the fact that he was incarcerated for a while allowed them to say, okay, here's some time served. So basically, as soon as he signed on the dotted line, as it were, he could walk as long as he stayed within his probation. And, you know, that's pretty compelling. You know, the difference between, you know, facing dozens of years, he was looking at 20 years uh, versus being able to walk what became today. He had been in for two years. Um, you know, that's, that's still pretty compelling. A lot of folks wouldn't be able to, uh, to turn that down. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, some say sometimes the criminal justice system, some say, is really legal blackmail. Uh, but sometimes you have to, you know, get somebody else who's a lower to get somebody higher. That's the nature of the system, like it or not. So let me go to Cavell O from YouTube. Cavell O has actually two questions. Let me let me put them together, Brian. Um, is there some type of legal obligation of the judge not to engage with witnesses or to lead them with questioning? And then um, if there's a follow up from Cavell O from YouTube. Did Ms. Love, that's the prosecutor, hurt her case today when she seemed to be insinuating that the witness's intention was simply to assist the defense? So I'll, I'll go with the first one. And I'm like, eh, kind of, because no one should be leading uh, a witness one way or the another. It's up to the attorney, whether it be prosecutor or defense attorney, to lead the witness through direct examination. However, it is the court's it is, sorry, it is the judge's courtroom and it is their discretion in terms of how they operate. And for things like foundational issues, like your neighbor was on what street or asking follow-up questions, you often see judges do that. So that's permissible. In, in terms of the second question, did she hurt her case? She's definitely not helping it. I, I mean, I get it. This is a confrontational witness in, in the sense of you really got to go after them to get the information you want. And clearly, she did not have the opportunity to prep the witness because their attorney was not there at the time and they refused to, which I, to me is their right to do so. Um, and no one should talk to a prosecutor without their attorney present. Um, it, it just seems like she's having a difficult time. And, it, and again, it begs the question, is this witness being evasive or is she not asking the right questions and is she being too combative? I don't know yet because I don't think the questions are properly formulated. Okay, so Joe Richards, I'm jumping around here, but Christian from YouTube has a really interesting question, something we may have forgotten about. How many witnesses will testify in this case? And let me put an addendum onto that. If today is any indication, how long is this case going to take with all these witnesses? <laughs> Well, uh, the short estimate is six months, um, but as it's going, uh, it could go longer than that. And there are literally hundreds of witnesses listed. Whether or not they'll actually be called, they will all be called. There will be a lot of witnesses for sure. Most people think that this is going to be the most complicated, maybe the longest trial in Georgia history. Um, so I would say there's probably be at least 100 witnesses, but there, I believe there's several hundred that are listed. They don't necessarily call everyone that's listed, but you have to list someone in order to call them. So to the point, 
Yeah, it's going to feel like forever. And it's going to be very, very important for the jury to be able to stay objective. And that's one of the reasons why um, the prosecutor and the, the defense attorneys, all the attorneys for that matter, have to really be careful about how they're coming off. You don't want to be the bad guy here in a very, very, very long trial. You want the jury to stay thoughtful, um, et cetera. And you want to make sure that a case that maybe you're behind on when you go into deliberation, you don't necessarily lose uh, because the jury was not thoughtful. So you got to make sure you don't get on the wrong side of it. And let me go back to you, Brian, because this is like a follow-up to something <laughs> you just answered. This is Tall Glass from YouTube asked, whose responsibility is it to prepare a state's witnesses, the state or their own attorney? Tall Glass, it is the state's responsibility. It is not the, the so for example, if I have a client that uh, that the prosecutor or government wants to, to question, I will make myself and my client as available as possible, but it is your job to make sure that that happens. Because at the end of the day, the jury's not gonna say, well, I was gonna vote for your side, but you know what, Brian Buckmeyer didn't bring his, his client in, in time for you to question them, so uh, I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt. No, it's the state's or the prosecutor's uh, job to do that. And let me go to almost kind of like a, a follow-up question here. Kira Sharp from YouTube, Joe Richardson, said, how does Miss Love know that Mr. Stevens, uh, slug, tick, spoke with the defense or that he was at a game with his kid? Well, you know, <laughs> the, the prosecutor has ways to find out things. If it was not said entirely, you know, uh, I would argue that the, the folks with the resources have eyes and eyes and ears everywhere, but still to the point though, she still got to get around. There's no good reason for her not to be able to make the best attempt possible to get the information that she's actually looking for. That preparation, by the way, which he, you know, needed to have his attorney there for, which is a perfectly reasonable request, could have helped to build the trust that she needs right now. Um, and so therefore, there's still the matter of for whatever the prosecutor may know and however it is that they may know it, particularly if it wasn't told to them, she still has a job to do. She's going to draw more bees with honey, and she really needed to build the house, hopefully, ideally, before she ever came to court with him so that he knew, wait, I'm not crazy about being here. I want to get out of here. I'm finished trucking school, whatever else. Here's what she's looking for. Let me get where I need to get. My attorney has said, I'm okay. We look both ways for across the street. Let's get this done so I can get out of Dodge. And Brian Buckmeyer, these are great questions. JC from YouTube also follows up. What would be a valid reason outside of the witness not showing up or refusing to answer a question for the plea deal to be revoked? Uh, to either plead the fifth to something that he's not allowed to or to, to, to an outright lie, uh, especially if it's material to the case. If it's something like, hey, did you turn left on the street as opposed to right, and he lies about that, they probably won't invalidate the plea deal. But if he comes up and says, YSL is not a gang and I, it was never a gang and I was never a part of that, I think that's gonna take away his plea deal. All right, let me, I think I have time for two more questions. If we do it quickly, Kamiko J from YouTube, is it mandatory for those who took a plea deal to testify? Joe Richardson. If they're called to testify, absolutely, yes. Okay, and Brian, last question to you. AJ Taylor from YouTube, do you think the state will potentially lose the jury with all of the pointless witnesses before both of you leave me? Yes, they could be drowned in information, especially information that they cannot properly articulate or connect towards the ultimate charges that they are set there to, to deliberate on. And there you have it from our great experts who are leaving me, uh, Joe Richardson, you are a civil rights attorney, but I know you're gonna be following this case and hopefully be back on with me. And Brian Buckmeyer, I know you're always here because why? You're a law and crime legal analyst who's been following this case. Now, I'm Linda Kenny Bott and I wanna tell you that we've reached the end of our question and answer for today, but we will be continuing this as this trial goes on. So send in your questions daily and to do that, you have to watch this trial. Stay with us here at the Law and Crime Network. We'll be right back. What, what, after this break.
Well, welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm Linda Kenny Bodden, and I will be with you for the next two hours. And we're still following that trial for Jeffrey Williams, also known as rapper Young Thug, and the five co-defendants in the case who are in the courtroom with him. Yes, all of them. Prosecutors allege that rapper Young Thug and co-defendants are part of a Young Slime Gang life young slime life gang i should say which is responsible for violent crimes in the atlanta area now the courtroom is currently on their lunch break and we'll be back at 1 30 so right now we have a very special guest we're going to catch up with wsb tv reporter michael seiden who has been in that atlanta courtroom uh, following this trial extensively and such a day when we left it michael seiden it's so great to have you on the show but the witness uh a uh, slug, uh, Trontavia said to the prosecutor, if you give me your hand, you know, I can show you. So what was the mood when he first entered the courtroom and what was the mood when they went to lunch? Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for having me on. I got to tell you, this has been the most compelling day thus far in the trial. You know, as soon as Trontavia Stevens, who you mentioned is also known on the streets as Tick and Slug, entered the courtroom, immediately there was this energy i noticed as he walked in he did not look to his right where all the defendants and their attorneys are seated he looked straight ahead in fact his lawyer was actually sitting behind us she was focused on him and i can tell you for the first time all trial there was actually every single defendant was sitting upright they were totally engaged when he took the trial because if you remember back to the indictment this man right here is an accused uh founder of the ysl gang so they know what this guy is going to provide for the prosecution so really a lot of energy in there you could definitely tell that everybody uh was paying attention for sure yeah now the prosecutor got into quite a dance with him about the significance of naming members of the rock crew and he talked about when he was uh you know 10 years old what was the significance of that michael yeah, so that, that's really important for your viewers to understand. So Rock Crew, which is an acronym, stands for Raised on Cleveland, which is the Cleveland Ave Avenue area uh, where a lot of these defendants all grew up. So the Rock Crew was a subset of the Bloods gang and prosecutors alleged, if you remember in opening statements, uh, prosecutors laid it out saying that a lot of these defendants were members of the Rock Crew, a criminal street gang. And then once that fell apart, they eventually uh, would form young slime life. Um, but what was so interesting about this, and I'm sure we'll get into it in a minute, is just at the point where she was asking him about the members and how he got involved, and that was really uh, an interesting back and forth inside the courtroom. Yeah, Jason, Jason, and there was Jason, Jason's little brother, and another little brother. But uh, before I get yeah. to that, do we know the details of the actual plea deal? And I assume he hasn't violated it because he's on the stand testifying and for the prosecution. Right. So I was actually reviewing that 35 page uh, plea review before I came on with you. And essentially back in December of 2022, uh, Trontavia Stevens, he pleaded guilty to one count of violating the uh, conspiracy to, to violate the RICO Act. And part of that plea deal was that he would be willing to get on the stand and testify. He would not be able to sit up there and take the fifth. He would actually have to provide uh, testimony. Uh, that would support the prosecution. Now, um, there's been talk about, is he violating it? Um, you know, that's a great question. I, I don't believe so, uh, but you can tell on some of these answers, she's repeatedly asking him, can you name members? Can you name it? And he's kind of just, oh, this guy, that guy, not being very specific. Um, you know, I think a lot of us in the courtroom are wondering why she just doesn't say, hey, is there anybody in here that was part of the rock crew and if so can you identify them so yeah i mean what part of the plea deal he was looking at anywhere from a minimum of five years to 20 years maximum maximum if he's convicted and of course if he were to violate those uh terms of his plea deal he would be sent to prison yeah, but he's got a sweet probation for eight years there's no doubt about that now how important do you think is his testimony and you mentioned something why doesn't she just say look around you anyone in the courtroom here part of rock crew anyone part of a ysl 
Yeah, I mean, there are going to be hundreds of witnesses potentially called, so there's tons of testimony. But I think for the first time in this trial, uh, I would say that he probably has the most important uh, testimony thus far for all the witnesses because this is a guy who they allege was there for everything. And really, I don't know if we have to use allege because he's already pleaded guilty in, in this plea deal. But of course, they're hoping that this is the guy that's going to start to spell things out. And we all know who the defendant all eyes are on uh, young thug uh, whose real name is Jeffrey Williams. So what they're, I believe, trying to get her, him to say is that, hey, you know, we were part of these criminal street gang. Uh, we went around committing all these crimes. He was a member. Um, that's what I think the prosecution's trying to get to, but I don't think they've gotten to it yet. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And that brings me to a follow up. You know, there was laughter in the courtroom when he answered some question. I mean, you know, he was talking about not being good at math. You know, most lawyers are only good, not good at math either, except for like 33 and a third part of your settlement. Uh, but there was laughter. So who is winning the public relations aspect in that courtroom between in the direct examination of the prosecutor, uh, again, with Slug, with Trontavious? Well, you know, it's 2024, so I feel like... Uh, you know, court of public opinions, everything is, of course, especially when you start looking in social media, um, you know, it, it, it's tough to say. I would say inside the courtroom, uh, people are not, uh, you know, everyone's glued to what's going on. But I mean, when you look around on social media and stuff, it, it does seem that people are getting bothered by the prosecution. They're they're wondering why um, these little crimes are, are being discussed. But again, you have to remember, as you know, as a lawyer, uh, we're talking about the RICO Act here. So you've got to show, you know, there's got to be like a pretense till you get to the to the actual, the big stuff that people really want to hear. So I think what they're doing right now is they're setting the stage uh, for the main event. And and that's what I think we're getting uh, eventually going to work to. But again, not a prosecutor, not a, you know, not, not ex totally sure what their, pro what their strategy is, but just from a layman's perspective, I would imagine that's that's what they're working towards. Okay, so you know I'm going to have to let you go, Michael, but I'll let you go on uh, a quick answer to what do you think the cross examination is going to look like? Quick answer. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously pure speculation, but I think they're going to go after his character. They're going to say, "Look, you got a plea deal here. Uh, of course, you're going to say things that the prosecution, you know, wants you to say. Um, you, you're a convicted felon. You've been committing crimes uh, left and right." And so I think they're going to go after his character. Uh, if you remember when they brought him in, he kind of they're painting the picture that you know he's trying to get his life back in order. He's got two kids. He just got his commercial truck driver license. He's looking for a job. So I think they're going to go after his character and try to make a point that. He, maybe he acted alone or wasn't involved with their clients. Michael Seiden, as usual, great reporting. I can't wait to have you back again. I know you have to get back into that courtroom. Thank you so very, very much. Appreciate it, as usual. Yeah, you got it. And, you know, we're going to continue on with our question and answers right now. We have Bridget Williams with us uh, to answer some of those questions. Keep them coming. Go to our YouTube chat. Uh, go to social media. Send them to us. And because we have so many today, I want to get to them. Bridget, hello. Nice to have you. you as everyone knows, you're a trial hello. attorney. You're a former prosecutor. You're a great trial attorney and great former prosecutor. So let me, let me throw this to you. Um, Talk last from YouTube has been following this trial. They asked a number of excellent questions. Isn't it work product with the defense and the st state's witness, John Tavius, uh, discussed yesterday? And if it isn't, why not? Is it the work product of what the states and, and Mr. Uh, Stevens discussed? It's it's not necessarily work product. Um, and so they're prepping him, prepping him for, for court. Um, and so whenever there's preparation for court, you know, they're going to go over questions that they may discuss or questions that they may ask on the stand um, if they did do that. Um, it was my understanding that Mr. Stevens didn't necessarily speak with the, with the state uh, because his attorney wasn't present. Um, but if they are going to be asking him questions in preparation for for trial um, or for anything like that, no, that's not going to be work product. That's going to be information that they're going to be discussing in order to try to talk about in a trial setting. And that's what the state's job is to do. Okay, so Bridget, uh, you heard that Brian Buckmeyer was here before, along with Joe Richardson. And this the, they've listened to this. And this is a question from Snook Dawan from YouTube, okay? okay? And, and, and you kind of get the import of this question. Why is the DA, that's Ms. Love, asking the same question a hundred times when obviously the witness is trying to give her the answer or doesn't remember or is not going to give her the answer. 
<laughs> and that's probably why she continues to ask him a hundred times. Um, so it is a part of his plea agreement that he will testify and he will not plea the fifth. He has a responsibility, pretty much. He is obligated to testify in this particular case. And so if she's not getting the answer that she wants, then she's going to go back and try to ask it in a different way um, in order for, to get him to say certain things. That's really what she's doing here. Um, he's already agreed that he would answer these questions. Um, he's already agreed that he's going to testify about the case um, as it relates to these particular defendants. So she's asking these questions 110 times because she's trying to get a specific answer out of him, really to say that he was involved in this gang activity, that it was a conspiracy, that they uh, actually did gang uh, activity amongst all the individuals who are there. And so that's what she's trying to get out of him. Well, except that maybe she should ask the direct question instead of going round and round and using the plea agreement instead of like, no, I don't want you to answer that and tell me who's who the first names are. I want you to answer the question my way. It's her way or and, and not necessarily answer. And I think that's where the problem is lying so far. Anyhow, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more on this explosive trial and fireworks in that courtroom today. Stay with us.
Thanks for coming back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Linda Kenny Bodd, and I'm hosting the question and answer period as the jury in the Young Thug trial is still on their lunch break. Uh, we all kind of needed a break from the fireworks of Trontavia Stevens being on the stand. He's also known as Slug and Ticket, and he took a deal at eight years probation to testify against the co-defendants who are in that courtroom. So let me go to some of our viewer questions. They're great. Matt Mangino is with me, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor. Bridget Williams, trial attorney, former prosecutor, also with me. But Matt, let me go to you for a couple questions because I know you took a break from me there. So uh, Jacqueline C. from YouTube asks, what happens to witnesses with plea deals that don't testify to what was agreed to in the deal. Does the deal get revoked? Do they go back to prison? Now, they have to testify truthfully. That's usually what's in there, because prosecution don't want to say you have to testify against every, anything, right? So, But what happens, let's say, if the prosecution alleges, you didn't testify truthfully, Tick? Well, it, the question would be, has there a, a sentence in this case? If it's just a plea that's been entered and the sentencing has been deferred, then that plea uh, offer will be taken off the table if you don't fully cooperate uh, with the conditions of, of the um, plea agreement. So here, you have to testify truthfully, but you also have to testify about what you know. So if you if you try to be evasive, if you, if you don't answer questions directly, if you don't provide information that you've already discussed with the prosecutor, the prosecutor anticipates you're going to present uh, during your testimony, then you're in breach of that agreement. It's a contract. And so that contract can be breached. And once it's breached, the prosecution can pull back on their offer and now go after you with the, uh, the full extent of the law. Okay, so Matt, let me follow up on that for our viewer who asked a very good question. I've never had somebody, uh, the prosecution charge that they've never, even when I was a prosecutor, that didn't testify truthfully, even if it wasn't everything that you wanted. Uh, as a defense attorney, I de t tend not to represent what we used to call snitches, so that doesn't usually arise. But what happens? Does the prosecutor just say you didn't testify truthfully and there's a hearing, or, or is there no hearing? What, what's the procedural mechanism? Well, I think procedurally, um, the prosecutor's going to go back and say, look, this is what, what your proffer was, so to speak. This is what you told us you could testify to. These are the, the, the persons that you could identify. These are the, uh, the uh, transactions that you were present for. And you took the witness stand, and you didn't present those, those facts as you presented them to us. So you either didn't tell the truth or... Uh, you didn't give the information that you had initially told us you would provide. So once that occurs, uh, you have this plea offer uh, that's been entered in front of the court. And then you go back to the court as prosecutor and say, hey, we had an agreement. Here were the conditions of the agreement. The defendant did not uphold his conditions. Now, the judge may want to say, OK, well, let's let's have a hearing. Let's take a look at, at what the testimony was. Let's take a look at the proffer. Or the court may say, hey, this is your sort of province, uh, Mr. Prosecutor, they didn't comply, you can withdraw the plea, and you go forward with the trial uh, on, on this particular defendant. Oh, that would be a lot of fun if that happens here. So, uh, Bridget, let me go to you. Uh, get back with me, get black with me, excuse me, I apologize, get black with me from YouTube. Would the defense score points by getting Stevens to say that the Rock Crew was a gang of guys tied to by living in the same neighborhood. He already said they didn't do group crimes. Point. Bridget. Well, I don't know if he would get points. I, I would think that maybe it's along the lines of, it's just they're trying to show that they were involved in gang activity, even at an early point, right? So when they were involved in the rock crew, that they, they were involved in gang activity at that time, then that faded out and then they formed YSL. Right. And so, I mean, getting him to say that they all grew up in the same neighborhood and they were involved in rock crew. I think that it's just it's, it's a starting point. Right. But what this case is about racketeering is them all being involved in the YSL Street Gang and then that they were through that involvement committed uh, different offenses for their own gain. And so that's really what the state needs to be looking at and proving. That's their job here. I want to get back to that, but first, it's a technical question. It's really not technical. It's a great question from Ben from YouTube. Matt, 
does the state have to prove RICO beyond a reasonable doubt or just the preponderance of the evidence? Well, it's my understanding that it's it's beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, in, in this situation, there have been a litany of charges. I think there's 191 different incidents where they've alleged that uh, that there's some sort of uh, racketeering uh, or there's some crime that was used in support of the racketeering. Um, you know, and and that was over a 10 or 11 year period. So there's a lot of ground uh, to cover here. And each one of those individual crimes, uh, whether it's murder or aggravated assault or kidnapping or drug distribution, uh, those all have to be proven uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and, and therefore, in order to sustain that the RICO charge, each of the underlying elements that um, indicates that there's a criminal enterprise it must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Great, great question, great answer, because that's what the lawyers are looking at, certainly the defense lawyers and also the prosecutors who have to prove their case. Bridget, Jody Kyles from YouTube. This is kind of along the lines of the questions you answered before, but a follow-up. How come no questions are being said or being asked of Tick or Slug at all referencing YSL? Instead, the prosecutor is mentioning all the other gangs, uh, specifically the Rock Crew, obviously. Isn't she losing the jury? Aren't they there for listening to who's in the YSL gang? That is what they are there for. However, she probably more than likely what I'm picking up from her is that she's trying to build up to that point, right? And so whenever you want to give them some foundation work and, and talk to the jury a little bit about what they started out doing, how do they all know each other? They all grew up on the same neighborhood. This is how, you know, they formed a friendship. This is how they have a closeness with each other. And then from that, when that dissolved, then they decided, well, we're still close with each other. Now let's form something else. And so, and that's, I think she's just laying the groundwork. She just hasn't gotten to it yet. This trial is set to last for quite some time. I believe the, the uh, prediction is up to six months. And so she's just getting started with this this particular witness, I think there will probably be some more questions that go a little longer, that go into talking about that YSL connection. Well, she's just getting started. We better add six and a half months because this is going to take a while because she hasn't even gotten to that 35-page or 37-page plea agreement. So, uh, Matt, A.J. Taylor from YouTube. Okay. Mr. Stevens made it his business to say, that's uh, uh, Trontavia Stevens, slug, tick who's on the stand, that he did crimes by his himself. Now, doesn't that hurt the state's RICO charge unless there's something more in that plea agreement and the factual basis underlying it that he pleaded guilty to? Well, it, you know, if he committed crimes himself, even if it was just him who committed it, was it committed in furtherance of this whole criminal enterprise? So just because he didn't go out with one of the other six defendants and commit a crime, was that crime committed in furtherance of this criminal enterprise. So let's, as an example, so let's say that, um, you know, that the uh, YSL was selling drugs and, you know, somebody uh, hadn't paid for the drugs that, that um, they received or they did something in terms of, of the drugs that they provided to YSL. And he went there and even the score with this person, went there himself and said, hey, listen, you know, I got ripped off and, you know, he kneecaps him. You know, that's a crime he committed himself, but he did it in furtherance of this wider conspiracy, this wider criminal enterprise that YSL is involved in. So that brings us to additional questions that our viewers have. Our viewers are just so smart. Uh, Renee, Sycamore mom from YouTube, uh, Bridget asks, since they're using, and they're meaning the prosecution, using old crimes that were already adjudicated or dropped, dismissed, as proof of a larger RICO crime, is there any double jeopardy considerations here? 
Hmm, that's a good question. Yeah, great um, question. <laughs> um, I, I would say that what they're looking for is, again, we're going back to what is the main charge that we're focusing on in this particular case. We're focusing on the racketeering case, but when we are doing it, they have to prove these underlying uh, cases underneath it, right? So when we're saying, I believe just as the co-panelists stated, when we're trying to prove this racketeering case, we are we have to prove every element beyond a reasonable doubt, and even those ones that are beneath it. And so when we talk about those ones that are dismissed, they're talking about those, but they're also including other cases in which they're, um, are, they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And so I think that's just one part of it. They're continuing to talk about additional crimes that are being committed in order to prove their overall charge here, which is racketeering. But you have to wonder whether or not it's going to hurt them. People say, why are we talking about weed possession here in 2024 that happened back somewhere in 2012? But anyhow, I'm looking. I have so many great questions from all of your viewers. Keep them coming on the YouTube chat, Facebook, uh, on Twitter. And when we come back, we'll have more of them. I'm looking at two. Danny from YouTube, Hip Hop Press 365 content. I'm just mentioning her name because I know you're going to come back here for that. Stay with us.
coming back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Linda Kenny Bodden. We have been covering, as you know, the trial of Jungfeld, the racketeering trial alleging that uh, that he's a member of a RICO uh, group, a racketeering group. And on the stand right now, supposedly one of his cohorts, why well, I say supposedly, because Trontavia Stevens has been testifying in that courtroom this morning. He took a deal uh, several years ago where he has stayed in jail for two years, and then he has eight years probation, and he's out. And he's out, but he's on the stand. But we're going to get back to that in a little bit because our viewers, you have had incredible questions here. YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, keep them coming. Let's go to some of them right now because I have with me still Matt Mangino, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, and Bridget Williams, trial attorney, also a former prosecutor. Okay, so let me go to you, Bridget. Hip Hop Press 365, content 100 from YouTube. Is the prosecutor being too aggressive with the witness? Sometimes a prosecutor can be a little too aggressive. Um, instead of being aggressive with him, it sounds like to me she should just kind of ask the straightforward questions that she's looking for. Um, and then you don't want to be too aggressive and then come across wrong to the jury. Um, and then the jurors not like you. You, you. You'll be surprised at what jury members actually remember. They remember the tone in which you were talking to the witness. They remember you know, your body language when you were talking to a witness, especially in such a long trial such as this and so that's something that the prosecutor needs to be more mindful of when asking these particular questions um she's prolonging her questions with this particular witness instead of kind of just asking some direct questions that could just kind of get her in and out um but like some southern people say here it's just like you attract more flies with honey than you do vinegar just get to what you need to ask those questions directly and get out yeah, Brian Buckmeyer was not too complimentary. He said, it seems like somebody's trying to be, who's the bigger, you know, donkey's back uh, in that courtroom here that's going on instead of just getting to the evidence where the jury's sitting there for over six months. Okay, so uh, Matt Mangino, let's go to the next question. This is really interesting by uh, Brandon Williams, uh, quick, Brandon Williams quick from YouTube, okay? If the case is won by Jeffrey Williams, what happens to the people that took the plea deals? Oh, well, look at that face. They weren't willing to roll the dice. And uh, when you're not willing to roll the dice, uh, you don't win. So if you've pled guilty because you're cautious, uh, because you uh, think that uh, there's too much at stake here and you don't want to, to, to risk you know, going to jail for an indifferent period of time, and then all of a sudden, the, the guy that you're testifying against is found not guilty. He walks. You do your time. Uh, that, that's just the way it goes. And, and you know, quite frankly, Linda, in all your experience, you know that that kind of thing happens. Uh, yeah. You know, people, they take a plea. They think they're going the low-risk uh, uh, way, and they end up, uh, serving time when the when the target of this investigation, the person they went after, walks free. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. That Regina, we've seen that all the time. So, uh, Bridget, okay, uh, get black with me. Had a follow up question to the prior question that they asked. Does the prosecution have to show that the Rock crew morphed into YSL? If not, why are they spending so much time on it? No, they don't have to, to show that. Again, we're, we're here to talk about the racketeering charge, right? And so what she's doing is, again, just laying the predicate to show that this is how YSL got started in the first place. How do we know each other? How are we related in some type of way? How is it that we have any type of relationship with these individuals? So she's just going back to years before they say, okay, well, this is how we, we know each other. We started with this rock crew, and then that kind of dissolved down, and then we decided that we're going to start YSL. So she doesn't have to prove anything as it relates to the rock crew. She has to prove that there was criminal activity going on. All these people that she's trying to prosecute were involved in that criminal activity and that they committed crimes in furtherance of that gang. That's her job. Okay, so Matt Mangino is a follow-up. Step on it from YouTube, uh, talking about proving things and proving things by, you know, co-defendants' testimony. This is a really interesting question. Could the prosecutors still unexpectedly call 
rapper and YSL associate Gunna to the stand, Matt Mangino. I give you the hard one, don't I? <laughs> well, no, you know, you have to build a case like this by calling people who have been involved in this enterprise. And, you know, one of the luxuries that prosecutors don't have is that they can't pick their witnesses. Okay, so you're stuck with the witnesses uh, that you have, the people who can provide uh, background, the people who can provide testimony. And, 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 and these are people who are going to provide testimony about crimes. You know, so, so they're typically not upstanding citizens. They're not the, sort of the cream of the crop. You wish you could call, you know, five nuns and five altar boys to testify uh, about this criminal enterprise, but it doesn't work like that. They, they don't, um, you know, the people who are involved in these cr criminal uh, enterprises are always uh, not the most credible. They have their own baggies that they take with them into the courtroom. They have criminal histories that can come back and, and bite them. So you're stuck with the witnesses that you have uh, in a criminal prosecution. And that's one of the more difficult things that prosecutors face. Okay, so, all right, Bridget, I don't want you to feel left out with the hard questions because this is a hard question, okay? All right. Why, and it's from Tall Glass from YouTube again. Again, we have great followers who have been following this trial and submit their questions every day, sometimes several of them because they're so good and they're so interested. Why didn't the state have everyone who pleaded testify? Why are they only going to have, we anticipate, a select few? And this is the first of the few. Yeah, and, and we don't know exactly who are they're going to be calling, right? So there is a laundry list of individuals that can possibly be testifying in this particular case. I believe the last time we checked, it was over 400 potential witnesses that could be testifying in this case. Now, will they be calling all 400 of those people? Probably not. But will they be calling a significant amount of them? Yes, we just need to wait and see when they're going to be calling those people. Um, and so, so far, this is all they have called and we don't even know the order in which they are going to call they don't have to to call those witnesses in a specific order they can do it in the way that they think will build their case the best so calling upon mr stevens at this time they may believe that this is what is best in order to grab the jurors attention at this time and then to build upon their case in order to get out the best facts in order to move forward in uh, proving for this rico charge and, and Bridget, you just answered Danny from YouTube's question. She asked whether the state has a witness list. Are they obligated to call every witness? The answer is no. And sometimes they put so many people on the witness list that they don't really intend to call. The judge actually made them whittle it down. So Matt Mangino, you know what Georgia's prior bad acts law is? I assume it's like every other state. I'm sorry. Um, bad acts, I... a prior bad act. When prior bad acts get admitted? Well, prior bad acts, if you can show that there, um, you know, is a, a consistent pattern, you know, a, a, a modus operandi where, where you have committed similar bad acts uh, in the past and, uh, and, and they are consistent with what's being alleged here. So, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, as a defense attorney, I would fight vigorously not to have prior uh, bad acts being admitted because it's almost as though, uh, you know, it, it's a conclu it, it, the conclusion has already been drawn. Well, you've done this in the past. We're bringing it up uh, because you did it this time as well. So I, I always think that this 404 uh, evidence is very prejudicial uh, to a defendant and, and can be very harmful to, to a case. Uh, and so, yeah, if, there, if it shows some consistent pattern, some modus operandi, yeah, maybe— you know, it's it's relevant to the case, but, you know, as a defense attorney, I'm going to fight it tooth and nail because I think it's so prejudicial. And that question, by the way, was from S. Jones. I neglected to say from YouTube. Thank you, S. Jones, for the question. Uh, Bridget Williams, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we're going to take a great break, but we're going to have a lot more questions on the other side. Okay, so uh, content channel from YouTube, Bridget, will each defense attorney get a chance to cross-examine this witness? 
Yes. The, just, the short answer, yes. The, each each defense attorney has the opportunity if they want to, to cross-examine the witnesses if they choose to do so. Um, I mean, some of them may have the exact same questions, right? And because um, this witness is testifying in, in like a joint trial amongst all of the, the co-defendants, right? Um, but each, each defense attorney has the opportunity to ask whatever questions they choose to do so. Um, and so it's, it's just a matter of time and de determining if they do have similar questions or, you know, if they want to ask questions, maybe one of the, the attorneys asked something that the other attorney was already going to ask, right? So, but they have the opportunity to ask whatever it is that they choose to in cross-examination. And because they represent different people, they have different interests, so one, some of their questions may implicate somebody else. And when you're sitting there with co-counsel, you're like cringing your head because you don't know what could come out that may hurt your case against the person you're representing as you're sitting in that trial, which is why you need co-defendants, usually. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more of your questions and answers, please submit them to our YouTube channel, uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, directly tweet at us, or I guess it's X at us nowadays. So, you know, whatever, send them to us. We're the Law and Crime Network. See you on the other side.
Okay, while the trial is at lunch hour, the Young Thug trial in Atlanta, uh, you know, when they come back, Trontavia Stevens will be expected to take the stand, retake the stand on this direct examination. But right now we have a great part of the show. Your questions that we have been answering, uh, viewers like you, keep submitting them. But let me go to some of them right now. This is just a favorite question of mine. Uh, Matt Mangino, Dawn Paisley from YouTube asks, if YSL is a gang, why didn't they charge record executives regarding royalties they wouldn't have no, they wouldn't have received uh, because if those royalties were being funded by criminal activities, why aren't they part of the whole RICO gang? Well, it's interesting. It's an interesting question, Linda. And so, you know, we we know that the um, young slime life is is the gang, and we know that the record label. Uh, you know, while it's YSL, it's it's young stoner life. And, you know, maybe it's a legitimate record label. Uh, and that legitimate record label is just also promoting the gang, uh, so to speak. Uh, you know, it's sort of, uh, you know, th this criminal enterprise, was it to influence the record industry? Uh, was it to influence, you know, their their talent? Or was it to influence other uh, illegal conduct that they were involved in? And I think the direction that prosecutors uh, are going in this case is that they had this uh, association that dates back years that evolved into this street gang, YSL, and that this criminal conduct, you know, many incidents of criminal conduct over a period of 10 or 12 years, was there to promote this criminal enterprise that, that is uh, namely, um, you know, the YSL gang and not necessarily the record company. And supposedly YSL came from the initials of Yves Saint Laurent, the designer, by the way, just as a little aside from something I read about this trial. I don't know if it's true, but it sounds pretty good. Anyhow, uh, let's go to uh, uh, Benjamin from YouTube, uh, uh, Bridget, okay? Um, why aren't they all charged with murder if this is an all-encompassing RICO charge? Well, that's not necessarily what the RICO charge means, right? RICO means that there were several individuals who conspired together to commit multiple crimes and in furtherance of those individuals. That's really what RICO means. So there may be some individuals charged with murder. There may be some individuals charged with kidnapping, some individuals charged with assault or possession of a firearm by a felon, possession of a firearm, period, and they should have never been uh, in possession of a firearm, right? And so just because one person is charged with murder doesn't mean everyone specifically is. The purpose here is that all of these individuals, they were involved in a gang and they committed different offenses. It could have been a combination of different things. And then they did those things in furtherance of those gang members. So that's what the, the racketeering case is all about. So, I imagine this is kind of a cute question, and I'm going to preface it by the fact that because we have these long lunch breaks, we're able to answer your questions. And so, without them, we wouldn't be able to answer your questions. You wouldn't be able to submit them here at the Long Crime Network. We're going to have people like Bridget and Matt answer them. But uh, one of our viewers says, uh, with regard to the, the jury, and it's Renee, Sycamore Mom from YouTube. Do juries get upset by excessive break times? They get back, and then there's another 45 minutes before they start, or they're taking a two-hour and a half lunch, and, and, you know, there's no trial time. Thoughts? Well, yeah, and, and you know, delay uh, frustrates jurors. Uh, you know, you're here doing your civic duty. You're here, um, you know, serving as a juror, and your time is essentially being wasted. I mean, you, you know, you don't mind committing yourself to listening to the evidence uh, and, and to ultimately making a decision in the case. But you don't want to sit in a jury room for an hour and a half you know, waiting to go back to hear a half an hour's worth of testimony and then go back into the, in, in, uh, the jury room while the judges and the lawyers hash out some other issues. You know, that's why, you know, judges uh, and, and, you know, counsel, you know, want to do things like uh, motions and eliminate where they can resolve issues whether or not something's admissible or not admissible prior to the trial starting 
so you don't waste jurors' times and you know uh, what to anticipate yourself a a as counsel in a case, you know, in terms of admissibility of evidence. But, you know, you have these long delays, and I know judges as, as well uh, despise these delays because, again, they know that it's keeping jurors uh, longer than they need to be held, and this is a long trial. And if this is this, the, the, the manner in which it's going to proceed, you're going to have some pretty flustered jurors in about six weeks when there's still another few weeks for this trial to uh, continue. So uh, I, I know it frustrates everybody, counsel, judges, and jurors. Well, maybe the prosecutor could streamline their case and maybe get to the questions that are important. That would do a lot to minimize what happens, but that's for another day. So I have to ask this question because I don't want to go without it being asked. I'm going to give it to you, Bridget, because I know when we get to the 2 o'clock hour, you're going to be leaving me. So you're going to get another one of my favorite questions. This is from Eric from YouTube. Eric from YouTube. Is Tick, that is Frontavia Stevens, also known as Slug, in the witness protection program? And I, I should say, or should he be? <laughs> Um, that, that's a very good question. Um, we are unsure of that answer. Um, whenever someone is, I'm sure that the the state, when they offer him a plea agreement, right, maybe in exchange for his plea agreement to testify against all of these particular defendants, maybe they offered him, you know, an opportunity to, to be in a witness protection program. Um, but that's not something that was necessarily disclosed. All of the plea um, information generally is not necessarily disclosed. We know some of the information, right, some of the terms, um, but him being involved in a witness protection program, that may have been something that the state offered to him in exchange for his testimony and for him to get up on the stand, not plead the fifth, be truthful, be honest, um, and also in exchange for the plea agreement that he received uh, where he got the two years, eight years probation, right? So yeah. um, it is, it's a matter of did they offer it to him? And we just don't know those details. Well, we know he's trying to get a GD degree but failed math. We know he's got a CDL license. He'll be driving trucks. So that's a good thing. I guess. So let me go to you, Matt Mangino, Aleph Calf from YouTube. Is there a balance between letting all the evidence in and smearing uh, guys? It appears the courts are letting a lot of past acts in that could damage these guys' image versus whether or not they're really relevant. That's, I know, a concern a lot of our viewers have. Well, yeah, I, I mean, obviously there's going to be some decision, as I mentioned a moment ago, pre-trial with regard to what evidence can be presented and what can be used against a, a specific witness. I would assume that these issues have already been resolved, or maybe that's why we're we're in a delay right now in terms of, of uh, the trial. Maybe they're trying to resolve uh, some of those issues. But listen, if you can bring it up, if it's if it's fair game, if the court has, has um, ruled that it's admissible or there's been no objection by the other side, uh, you know, then then this information is yeah. relevant. It's going to be used, and, it, and it's going to continue to be used. I'm not going to leave something on the table that I could use in the case just because I don't think, well, you know, maybe this isn't fair. The court speaking, will decide. Let me just say, Matt, though, but speaking of, speaking of that, because we only have a minute left to go, and Bridget, you have to leave me, so your answer is going to have to be quick. J.O. Say from YouTube asked, how much money did YSL gang make, allegedly, because the state showed nothing but nothing about profit. You have about 20 seconds. Well, we don't know necessarily what they're making. Um, it, again, the, the purpose of this case is are they committing offenses that were in furtherance of a gang, um, it, committing crimes that were in furtherance of this particular gang? So we don't know necessarily what their profit was, but it's something that may, they may bring into evidence. We'll just have to wait and well, see. Well, we'll see. We're, we're kind of creeping there slowly. So, Bridget, thank you very much. <laughs> Matt Mangino, you're staying with me. And there's fireworks in that courtroom as Trontavia Stevens, who took a deal, has been on the stand under direct examination. Stay with us here at the Law and Crime Network, and we'll keep you up to date with all that is happening.
So welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Linda Kenny Bodden, and I will be with you again still for the next hour. And we are still and gratefully answering your questions here on the network as we wait for that Atlanta courtroom to come back from their lunch break. And you know we're in the trial of Jeffrey Williams, also known as rapper Young Thug, and his five co-defendants. Uh, the rapper is facing racketeering charges for his alleged affiliation with the Young Slime Life Gang, also known as YSL. Now, according to prosecutors in the case, the Young Slime Life Gang is responsible for multiple violent crimes, including murders, shootings, carjackings, and other racketeering... <laughs> Mr. Steele, who's the interloper at your table that you introduced me to yesterday? And I apologize, I wanted to. Um, Your Honor, this gentleman is a Graham, B R A M, man's back. Like M A N S B A C H. And he is in Hamilton College. He's studying for the LSAT. He's a senior. And, um, he was uh, extremely bright, and he's been working with us on Mr. Williams' case, uh, both remotely and when he's in Atlanta. Okay. He school, uh, and I appreciate it. I hope it's okay. I think both of them are okay. But uh, he's uh, helping out. And he's also, um, and, uh, I tell everyone that he actually runs a four minute and 15 mile or less. So, uh, Intelligent. Impressive. All right. Young man, welcome, okay? All right. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and summon our jurors first, please. Thank you. It's crispy, isn't it? I said, you're Christian. <laughs> so I, I got you. Um, yeah, I read it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Everybody's present in All right, thank you, Sergeant Ingram. All right, Ms. Love, you may continue with your examination, madam. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon again, Mr. Stevens. Good afternoon. Did you have a good lunch? I ate some trail mix. Some trail mix? Okay, well, if you get hungry, let us know. We'll stop, right? All right. So when we last left off at lunch, you were talking about the hand signs that you know are affiliated with sex money murder. Would you tell the jury how it is that you are aware that those are hand signs that are affiliated or connected with sex money murder? Um. Really? Like word of mouth, like um, being around, being in the streets. Being around and being in the streets. Have you ever used those hand signs? I have. Have you ever falsely claimed that you're a murder? No. No one. 
I never got jumped in. Um, I never knew anyone who was like really an official. You said something interesting just now. You said, I never got jumped in. Could you tell the jury what that is? Um, like the initiation process. And what is the initiation process? Being jumped in. I, I, I asked that, that question narrowly. Yeah. The question um, just brought. I'm, I'm going to overrule the objection at this point in time, Mr. Steele. Thank you, Honor. You may answer that question. Um, the initiation process? Yes, you said that being jumped in was the initiation process. Right. And I asked you, what is the initiation? I'm overruling the objection, Mr. Steele. You may ask me a question, Mr. Jerry. The initiation process? Yes. What is it? Oh, to be jumped in? Mm -hmm. What does that consist of? Um, a fist fight. This fight? Yes. Okay. Between who? Um, a person who's already in and a person who's trying to get in. And to what end? How long does the fist fight have to take place? Um, I guess to the person who um, initiating the person say it's enough. All that type of stuff was going on in the juvenile facility that I was in. Now, my question to you, and I appreciate your answer, was have you ever falsely claimed <coughs> sex money murder? I've never been jumped in. I, I'm asking you. So I, I never have went. You ever, have you ever falsely claimed sex money murder? I'll sustain the objection. Let him finish, Miss um, yes. Love, okay? I, I never went through the process of being jumped in the initial game. Have you ever falsely claimed sex money murder? Yes. You have falsely claimed it? Yes. Where and how often? So... I've never been jumped in, so like, ever since I started saying it, ever since I was in juvenile and I got a tattoo of a B, basically. Say that one more time. Ever since I was in juvenile and I got a tattoo of a B. And you got a tattoo of a B. Yes. Okay. Now, is Rock Crew affiliated with Sex Money Murder? I'm rock crew, and I know about sex money murder, so yes. I'm sorry, say that one more time. I'm a part of rock crew. I was mm -hmm. a part of rock crew, and I was a part of uh, sex money murder, so yes. Are other members of rock crew a part of sex money murder? My other members are part of Rock Creek Sex Money. Yes. Do you see any members of Rock Crew or any people who were members of Rock Crew in the courtroom today? No one in this courtroom was initially raised on Cleveland. So there's no way that they can be part of rock crew. So you're saying that there's no one in this courtroom who was ever a member of rock crew? 
No one in this courtroom was raised on pleading with me to be able to be a part of a crew called Raised on Cleveland. Mr. Stevens, um, I, I appreciate what you're telling us. I'm asking you, was anyone in this courtroom besides yourself ever a member of Rock Crew? Yes, wasn't the question was, the question now, that wasn't what the question was. So is it forming the question, Mr. Herman? I object to the form of the question. Okay, all right. I sustain that objection. All right, you can rephrase, Madam, if you can. Was anyone in this courtroom, besides yourself, ever a member of Rock Crew? No, because you have to be born and raised on Cleveland Avenue to be a part of Rock Crew. Was anyone in this courtroom, besides yourself, ever affiliated with Rock Crew? Yes, because they know me. Who? Some of them weren't even around when the Rock Crew era was going on. They kind of been like... Dang. No, can none of them be like a part of Rock Crew? Okay, so you said none of them could be. So no, no one in his, here in this courtroom besides yourself, it's your testimony, has ever been affiliated with Rock Crew. No. A part of Rock Crew? I don't understand. What part don't you understand? The uh, question, the entire, uh, the entirety of the question. Okay. Is there anyone in this courtroom besides yourself who's ever claimed to be a part of or affiliated with Rock Crew? No, no one claimed Rock Crew. Speculation. I stand in this suit. Uh, uh, that was Mr. Sharp and Mr. Matthews sustained this to both oh. grounds. So you can rephrase now. To your knowledge, has anyone in this courtroom besides you ever claimed to have been affiliated with Rock Crew? Can going to neighborhood clubs be a form of affiliation? I can't answer the question or testify. You have to tell the jury whatever your answer is. If that is the case, yes. And so, who are these people? That went to the club with Rock Crew? Because that was my answer to my question. Okay, so, sure, let's start with that. Who are those people? That I've club with, that I've been to a club with. That you said went to the club with Rock Crew. I almost been to a club with every. One of them, except the younger one. Would you name the people here? First and last name? Yes, sir. To my best ability. Okay. Um, dang, I don't even know their name. What do you call it? Quay. Okay, who else? Um, Jeffrey. You know his last name? Williams. Okay. Um, Shannon. Still will. Okay. And I don't know his name. I don't know his last name, but I call him Quay. And uh, Demonte. Okay. Kendra? Yes. How long have you known Quay? Um, Oh, 
I'll rule the objection, Mr. Matthews. Which one? You know what? I'm glad you asked me that. Tell me who in this courtroom you're referring to as Quay by the clothing that they are wearing. Let's start with um, the first Quay. The first Quay is right here with the brown. Okay. And when you say right here with the brown, is he seated between a man in a purple suit and a man in a blue suit? Yes. Okay. And who is the second Quay? Um, in the back, in the far back. Okay. Your Honor, would the record reflect that the first quay was identified as Mr. Marquadius Huey? It shall. And you said the second quay is in the back? Yes. Where is, what is he wearing? Um, black. Right. And where is he seated? In the back. Next to whom? Um, you, t you asked me to say their name, I don't know the name. Oh, a uh, gentleman in a brown suit and gray suit. So a gentleman on one side in a brown suit yes. and a gentleman in another side on the gray suit? Yes. Is he seated at the first table, the second table, or the third table? Second table. And is he the second person from the end as to your left? Yes. Your Honor, with the record reflect that the witness has identified Mr. Quay maybe as the witness. It shall. Thank you. So how long have you known Mr. Marquadius Hughes, whom you call the Quay, the first Quay? Um, I already know of him. He uh, used to come to the to Mountain Park and play basketball with us. What's the answer? How long have you known? So the, the time frame I have problems with now. I'm, I've been telling you this since I've been up to understand. Pat, do you know if you've known him longer than five years? So can I say is um I knew him before I went to prison. It is the truth. Yes. When did you go to prison? Um, 2015. So you knew him before 2015? Yes. Okay, thank you. And what about Jeffrey Williams? How long have you known him? course before I went to prison. I'm sorry. I said before I went to prison, but like probably three years before that. Why did you say of course before I went to prison? No, nah, because I used prison as an example to help me time frame um, the first person that I ref referenced to. So I'm going to use prison to help me with the time frame for the second person I okay. reference to. And how long have you known Shannon? Um, I met Shannon in like probably 2014, 2013. Probably 2014, 2013. 2014 or 2013? Yeah. And what about Diamante? Um, I actually went to elementary school with him. Um, I didn't see him again until after prison, after elementary school. Okay. So how long has that been? Since what year? Um, so I went to elementary school with him. I didn't see him again until after I was released from prison. So, I really don't know too much of the adult him. Okay. I knew him as a, a, a child. Now, did you both, you went to elementary school, were you living on Cleveland Avenue while you were in elementary school? Yes. Where was Diamante living during that time? I'm not sure, I just know we were in third grade together. 
And how long have you known Quarabia Mika? It's the one you call the second question. Um. He he's younger than me, okay. so I knew of him to be out and about around the neighborhood, hanging with like some of the more guys younger than me. And when I came home from prison, he was older, and like <laughs> we probably got to really kicking for like a year, and he went back to jail. So I technically know like. Um. Come on up, Mr. Harvey. All right, I'm going to deny the motion uh, as proffered. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just as an uh, instruction to you to disregard the witness's last statement, okay? All right, continue. Mr. Steele, using only and not referring to anything else, 
Uh, is it fair to say that you've known Mr. Farbabius Nichols since? Objection to meeting. I need to meet. I'm going to overrule your objection, sir. Since, Go ahead, madam. Since around 2015, or a little bit after, without that's yes or no. So will you begin with your question? And someone says objection. It, it like throw my whole train of thoughts off. Okay. So I ask you how long you've known Farmanius Nichols, the person that you refer to as the second play. And then I am asking you, is it fair to say that you have known him since around 2015 or a little bit after? That's yes fair. Or no? yeah. That's yes. All right. Now, since we also talked about sex, money, murder, to your knowledge, is there anyone in this courtroom who has claimed sex, money, murder? Not to my knowledge. Would you tell the jury what someone would do in your presence that would make you consider them to be claiming sex money murder? In my presence? An example of something you would need to see a person do for you to perceive them as claiming sex money murder. I think I'll go by what they tell me. Would you also go by hand signs that they do in front of you? Mm, no, because anyone can do that. Have you seen anyone in the courtroom do sex money murder hand signs? They could have been doing any hand type of hand signs. Have you seen anyone in the courtroom doing sex money murder hand signs? They could have been doing any hand signs. <laughs> Science. I could have. I'm not certain I understand your answer. Would you clarify whether or not you have seen anyone in the courtroom do hand signs that you recognize to be sex, money, murder hand signs? So they could have been doing a particular hand sign, and it could have been meaning something totally different from sex, money, murder. Have you seen any that you recognize as being like sex, money, murder? I don't recall. We talked a little bit before lunch about members of rock crew and gang activity. Do you remember that? Yes. Do you have personal knowledge of whether um, any of your family was Selling drugs for, for rock crew? Do I have personal knowledge that yes. any of my family? No, I, I you said that. Hold on. Come on up.
To your knowledge, has your any member of your family sold drugs for rock? Yeah, I'll, I'll stand the objections to form. Can you tell, um, rephrase that, madam? Yes. <clears throat> when were your brothers members of rock? So we all, my brothers, so we all, I'm speaking on behalf of my brothers, we all like gravitated towards the streets at the same time. So are you able to tell the jury to any degree of specificity the time during which your brothers were acting as members of Block? I'm sorry, but I told you I'm bad with timing. It's okay. You don't have to apologize. So, understanding that at any time when they were a part of Rock Crew, were your brothers, do you know whether your brothers sold drugs on behalf of Rock Crew? No. No. Is your answer no, you do not know, or no, they never did? I know my brothers didn't sell any drugs on behalf of Block Crew. Okay. I'm going to show you what has been marked and already been, and thank you. I'm going to show you what has been marked and already been provided to the defense as a specific As a specific one, you. One, you as a uniform. Two, you. Three, you. Four, you. Five, you. Six, you. Seven, you. Eight, you. 
A, U, Bravo, Laura Casey. Nine U. And asked you if you recognize the images. Yes, sir. Sure. Yes. Of course. if you recognize without commenting on what they are because until they are introduced we can't show the jury okay yes so i'm going to put them in front of you one at a time do you recognize that image depicted in the photograph label states exhibit one u yes yes do you recognize the image depicted in two u yes do you recognize the image depicted in three u yes do you recognize the image depicted in 4 U? Yes. Do you recognize the image depicted in 5 U? Mm, yes. Do you recognize the image depicted in 6 U? Yes, then. Just not saying what it is. Oh, no. All okay, right. you recognize yeah. the image? You recognize the images depicted in 7 U? Yes. You recognize the image depicted in 8 U? Yes. Do you recognize the image depicted in 8UB as in Bravo? Yes. And do you recognize the image depicted in 9U? Yes. Do you recognize, uh, are each of these images depicting you or a part of your body? Yes. All right. Or something affiliated with you? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. All right. Your Honor, and are they fair and accurate representations of each of the images I've shown you? You ain't showing me them right now. These are not ones that they ain't got nothing to do with me. They are you, but they're smaller pictures. Oh, all right. Yeah. So, are they fair and accurate representations? Yes. Yeah. Your Honor, the state tenders of one U through uniform. Okay. <laughs> one uniform. Through seven. Nine, through nine uniform, inclusive of the um, photographs, which include the Bravo designation. So it's which one has a that would be eight has a uniform Bravo designation in yes, it. Any other one? And I believe there is only that one in this okay. set of Any objection um, to states one uniform through uh, nine uniform? Council. Yes. All right. States one uniform, two uniform, three uniform, four uniform, five uniform, six uniform, seven uniform, eight uniform, bravo, and nine uniform uh, are admitted and may be published as you see fit. All right. So. It's a B with a money bag. It's an F and it's a L for um, like with the picture of a gun. Okay. So you said that the B is a money bag. Yes. All right. 
Is there a color around that? Yes, is there a color around the F? What color is it? Red. All right. And the B, that's the money bag. What is the F formed from? So the whole... Wait, before you get into the whole, can you just... Let's go step by step. Can we do that? Is that all right with you? So... I gotta explain the first part to get to the second part. You, you, you're speaking on the second part. So I'm, I'm gonna take you from the top to the beginning, to the end. We'll go there. Can we start with the F? Just tell the jury what it's formed from? What it's made of? Oh, what, what F this is? Yes, how it's, how it's formed. What is that forming the letter F? It's a F, it's like a, uh, I wanna say it's a, like a skater brand, like a skateboard brand or something. Is there a red star in the middle of that F? Yeah, I got it on the middle. Okay. And what is the L made of? Is that a gun that the L is made of? Yes. Okay. And you wanted to explain something? Yes. Go ahead. So, it's abbreviated for BFL. So I got the money bag first, so it stands for Bank first and last. Basically, put your money first and last. And it does not stand for blood for life. No. That's why the money bag, I actually got a, that, that's why the money bag right there. Okay. Why is yeah. that red star there? I wanted to add some color to it, and red is the only color that my body will take because of my dark skin. I'm going to show you what has been marked as three uniforms. Can you see what's on the screen for three uniforms? Yes. Would you tell the jury what we're looking at, what part of your body we're looking at the, the in back, three uniforms? The back of my neck. And what is what are the letters printed on the back of your neck that are shown in State's Exhibit 3 uniform? A K, a A, a N, a T. A F, a, G, a I, a G, a H, a T. And below that, is there another word? Yes. What is that word? F A T E. Okay. And so, what is that sentence? Uh, what is that phrase when you put it all together? Can't fight fate. Okay. How do you spell can't? C A N T. Um, three or two. Why do you have it spelled with a K on the back of your neck? Because it was my body and I wanted to do what I wanted to do with my body. And you're entitled. Right. Is there any particular reason you chose to change the letter C to a letter K? I wanted to seem original, so I, I initially got the initial quote from a movie called Law Abiding Citizens, mm -hmm. and that uh, phrase was an uh, important part in the movie. So, and I didn't want people to think that's where I got it from, so I wanted it to seem original, like I thought of it. Now, are those letters in ink that are on your neck? Yes. Does that wash off? No. So it's permanent? Yes. Showing you state's four <clears throat> uniform. Tell the jury what we're looking at in four uniform. So this is merch from an ongoing show that was going on at the time. It's like um, stuff that artists sell to like bring in more income from like the initial show. It's like equivalent to performing, so it's like more income. So being more specific, is that a red hat? Yes. And is that your red hat? Yes. Are there letters on the red hat? Yes. What letters are on the red hat? Bompton. Would you spell that for the court reporter? B-O-M-P-T-O-N. Now, is, 
Is that meant to be Compton but replacing the C with a B? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to show you what we've already admitted as State's Exhibit 5U uniform. Would you tell the jury what we're looking at um, in terms of the portions of your body with writing on it in State's 5U? Is that your right hand? So, yes, it's my right hand. And is there writing on the side of your right hand, yes. um, the back side of your right hand? Yes. Is there a word? Yes. And what word is written across your right hand? Cleveland. Is it still there? Yes. Would you hold it up for the jury? Sorry. All right. And are there letters written across your fingers of your right hand? Yes. What letters are they? ROC. All right. And are we looking at your left hand in states exhibit six units? Yes. What's written on the back side of your left hand? What word? Uh, L, short for Avenue. And are there letters on yes. your fingers? Yes. What letters? Um, C, R, R, E, or W. Are those uh, letters in permanent E? Yes. And are they meant to um, signify the gang you mentioned earlier, Rockford? Yes. Right. Or raised on Cleveland? Yes. And 7U, is that just your right and your left hand put together? Yes. All right. <clears throat> We're going to stop sharing for a moment. Now, do you remember where it was um, that you were when Stacy exhibit one uniform, two uniform, three uniform, four uniform, where those photographs were taken of you? Yes. And were those photographs taken during an encounter um, with law enforcement? Yes. And were those law enforcement officers inclusive of Investigator Feldman? Um, that was a while ago. I don't, I'm not even familiar with Okay. Fair enough. I, I remember the, uh, the officer who took me to jail because me and him had the last name, and I was joking with him. We got the last name. You can let me go. So that's how I remember that. All right. Were you being arrested at that time um, for an incident that occurred on or about October the 11th of 2014. Yes. And did that incident involve the armed robbery of a female? Yes. Uh, and did that armed robbery, uh, were you alleged to have robbed the female of money, a cell phone, <coughs> and other personal property using a firearm? Yes, it was uh, 15000 worth of hair weave. Okay. So the allegations and the accusations of the crime were completely false. Um, I went to court, and the judge handled the case, and the charges were dropped. Okay. That was October the 11th of 2014 that that was alleged to occur. Yes. All right. Um, now, what's I'm going to show you what has been marked as State's Exhibit 16U, and without talking about what it is, I need you to just look over it and tell me if you recognize it for the jury. I'm going to let you read each page, but... Can you go back to the front page? Yes. Yes. Oh, no, no. I got it. It's the same thing. Okay, I'm going to put it right here and let you just flip through it without showing it to the jury. Okay. Page by page. Take your time. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Let's see that one. Sure. Mr. Seals, let me hold this up. Go ahead. Your Honor, I'm going to approach Mr. Seals. Is that okay? You may not.
Say again. Oh, I think it's the title sequence. Your Honor, I, I object to it. He's playing. Did you I don't want to show you to If you're going to show it to him, you probably should oh, show it to him. I'm going to show it to him. Yes. I think it's the title sequence. Yes. Did you rec let me let you finish looking at it? That's true. The I recognize. You did? Yes. All right. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of the document? Um, let me back, back up and ask you. 16U is composed of five pages, right? Yes. And is your signature on the fifth page? Yes. And did you put your signature on the fifth page? Yes. Is this a fair and accurate reflection of the document that you put your signature on? Yes. All right. Do you see any material alterations, anything different? No. State tender states exhibit 16 U as evidence, 16 uniform as evidence. All right, any objection to state 16 U? All right, state 16 U is admitted, maybe published as you see fit. Thank you, Judge. And I'm now going to show you state exhibit uh, 15 uniform, 15, 1 5 uniform. <coughs> and ask you if you recognize 15 uniform as well. Yes. All right. And how do you recognize 15 uniform without saying what it is? It's five. Yes, sir. <laughs> sure. Was this a piece of your personal property? Yes. And is it a fair and accurate representation of personal property that was taken off of you on the date that uh, the other pictures we referenced yes. were taken off? Yes. Your Honor, we tender states exhibit 15 uniform as evidence. Any objection? Hearing none, states 15 uniforms admitted that he published as you see fit. Thank you, Judge. Would you tell the jury what we're looking at in states 15 uniform? So. Just start off with what it is, and then you can talk about anything else you want, okay? It's a red bandana. All right. Where was this red bandana on your person? Probably in one of my pockets. Which one? I don't recall. Did you routinely wear a red bandana? And why did you say, let me back up and change that question. Why did you say probably in one of your pockets? Because, as you can see, the uh, item is on top of my car. Mm -hmm. So they was like pulling all type of stuff out of my car. And that actually, if I'm not mistaken, that has the same words as the other one on the front. It was also merch. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it was like, it, it went together because that was the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That was the, uh, what the song that the merch was, was pushing, like that's what, that's what, what the song was. What was the song? Um, Lifestyle, so that's the, that's the theme of the song, basically the word I'm looking for. Okay, what was the So song? if I'm not mistaken, the front of it, I think it had like, either rich game or probably the same thing. You need to look at it again. Yeah, you can't see it because it's laying on, I mean, 
You can't flip. There's images in here. Okay. Right. So you're saying part of what we see is not reflected. Right, so it had words on it. It was also too much. Okay. Yes. And and that's your red car that is laying on. Is that what you were saying? Yes. Okay. Now, is there something to the uh, left of that red bandana? Yes. What is it? Well, it's, um, money in the form of dollar bills. Okay. Is that your money? Yes. How did you make that money? Do you remember? That looked like probably twenty dollars. I probably asked somebody to borrow it or something. I don't know. Okay. And who were or was the artist who did lifestyle? Um, Jeffrey. Jeffrey Williams. Yes. In the courtroom today. Yes. What is the theme of the song Lifestyle? You said that Bompton and the red bandana. Yeah. What was the thing? So uh, the colors for the initial like rich gang collaboration was black and red. So that's where the thing came from. Okay. So um, by him collabing with rich gang, they sought to it that the colors be presented with the. The uh, the song, the theme, the image he was trying to push, present. Was the red meant to stand for anything in particular? Nah, it was just the theme, the color of the thing. I think the album cover at that color, that time was like that color or something. Was the red in any way indicative of the blood gang? Indicative, I'm sorry. I ain't... Was it meant to stand for... Um, Represent. Not from my understanding. So you don't. That no. had nothing to do with sex, money, murder, or blood. Yeah. Okay. Now your legal name is Trontavious. What's your whole name? Trontavious. What's your middle name? Kendale. Kendale. Are you also called Tick? Yes. And how is that spelled? T I C K. Are you also called Slug? Yes. How is that spelled? Yes, uh, U-G. Have you ever had um, the Instagram handle original slime underscore slug? Yes. All right. And how long uh, have you had that handle? Do you know since what year approximately? How long did I have it? Him? Did you have it in 2014? Trying to think because I actually lost that page when I went to prison because of I ain't okay. had no phone or anything. Prior to 2015, is it fair to say you had that handle? Prior to 2015, yes. Okay. And are you familiar with a handle, Thugger Thugger One? Yes. How are you familiar with that handle? Um, Whose handle is that? Um, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. I think that's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeffrey Williams. Williams. Okay. The same Jeffrey Williams in the courtroom today? Yes. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to show you what I've marked as 10 uniform. 10 uniform. Bravo, lowercase Bravo, 11 uniform, 11 uniform Bravo, 12 uniform, 12. and ask you if you recognize the images depicted in first starting with 10 uniform. Yes. Okay. 10 uniform Bravo, is that your face? Yes. Your person? Yes. And you don't need reading glasses, do you? Don't have no. Okay. All right. Can you see, without talking to the jury, um, do you see yes. your Instagram handle? Yes. And do you see the Instagram handle that you referenced a minute ago as well. Yes. All right. 
Are these fair and accurate images so far? Yes. All right. What about 11 uniform? You recognize that? Yes. All right. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of the people who have been photographed in 11 uniform? Is this a fair oh, yes. copy of the picture? Yes. All right. As showing you 11 uniform Bravo. <clears throat> Do you recognize the Instagram handle on 11 Uniform Bravo? Yes. Is that yours? Yes. All right. So is this a fair and accurate reflection of 11 Uniform Bravo? Yes. Showing you 12 Uniform. Do you recognize 12 Uniform? Yes. All right. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of the folks that are depicted inside? Yes. Your Honor, the state tenders at this time, 10 Uniform, 10 Uniform Bravo, 11 Uniform 11 uniform Bravo and 12 uniform. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sure. Here and um, just for clarity, this is the uh, each of those that I had provided. Yeah, just want to see the. Uh... <laughs> Uh, any objections to uh, 10 uniform, 10 uniform Bravo, 11 uniform, 11 uniform Bravo, 12 uniform, or 12 uniform Bravo? All right. Uh, those are admitted. Uh, they may be published as you see fit. Thank you, Officer. Mr. Stevens, would you please state your name for the record? Yes. What is merch? Is it short for something? Yes, it's short for merchandise. Okay. I think, I don't, I think so. Okay. I just always said, I heard the word merch. Is that what you meant? Yes. All right, merchandise. Okay. You, you say, is that what I meant it to mean? I meant it to mean merch. All right, then we'll call it merch. Right. All right. Now, during the time that you encountered the... Detectives, when you were being arrested for that armed robbery uh, of the young lady on October the 11th, 2014, did you, do you recall having a conversation with the detectives? Yes. And do you recall talking to them about the tattoos that are on your body? No. Uh, it been a while. 2014, that was 10 years ago. I don't recall. All right. You know what? You're better than me. I forgot it was 2014, 2024. Mm. Yeah. All right. So, do you recall them asking you what Rock Crew stood for? Again, that was 10 years ago. Um, do you recall telling them? that you were a member of a gang called Rock Crew? I'm still, I'm still gonna go with the time frame. Understanding the time frame. Um, and showing you as well, 16 uniform. <clears throat> On page Did you, was, was I supposed to be Reading what you just pointed at? Not yet. Oh, oh. On page three of 16 uniform, would you read number five? Just read what it says. My S? No. Yes, please. When asked by law enforcement about defendant's wire cell and rock crew tattoo, defendant truthfully advised law, law enforcement that defendant is a member of a gang called Rock Crew. 
but that group is no longer going by that name and now goes by YSL, which originally stood for Young Slime Life. Okay. Can I explain? I just needed you to read that, and we'll talk about what we asked the questions and we can get into that part. Okay. Your Honor, the question didn't call for an explanation. It did. You can follow up later on that, but so. All right. <coughs> and Mr. Basis. Yes, Your Honor. I think the witness should be allowed. He was asked whether or not that was his statement. No, Your Honor. Which led me to believe this, the paragraph that was uh, asked to be read was a paragraph that he read that is his statement. So I think he should be. Permitted. What's the basis of your objection? He should be allowed to uh, complete his, his uh, testimony on that topic. I'm going to overrule your objection. You both counsel are, are apt to. Uh, uh, when your examination time comes to, to complete that, okay? All right. I'm going to now show you page two of what has already been admitted as State's Exhibit 16 Uniform. And I'm going to ask you to read number one under the heading Defendant's Factual Acknowledgements. Would you please read that verbatim? Young Slime Life, a.k.a. YSL, is an organization made up of three or more members or associates who share common identifiers that include but are not limited to colors, hand signals, and terminology who have committed crimes intended to increase the notoriety, street credibility, and reputation of YSL. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Well, did you admit 16 When did you do that? Yeah. Um. I don't think you did. <laughs> I, I, I think it's been shown the witness, but it hasn't been tendered as of yet. I, I could be wrong. I mean, I. 16, 16 uniform. 16 uniform. Yes, ma'am. When was it admitted, Christine? Today? Okay, all right. I'm sorry, ma'am. Continue. I apologize. Okay. Mr. Stevens, and when you testified earlier in identifying 16 uniform and spoke about your signature. Would you please tell the jury what date it is that you signed 16 uniform? December 29th, 2022. Okay. Now, were you forced to sign 16 uniform? No. Persuaded, but not forced. You were persuaded. Yeah. So are you stating now under oath that you did not sign 16 uniform yes, I, freely I, and voluntarily? Yes, yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You signed it freely and voluntarily. Yes. And you understood what you were signing? Did you understand what you were signing? That's a better question. So the state's initial offer with this plea was on the 27th. I need you to ask. I asked the gentleman to allow him to finish his answer. Yeah, let me. I asked that he answer and then explain. The answer was affirmative or negative, and he did not answer. So I asked. And you got him on direct, though. Uh, right. All right. So, so okay. All right. I'm so a, I'm gonna sustain the objection. Go ahead and do. Go ahead and ask him or let him complete his you know, his answer. Did you understand sixteen uniform? So that was part of my answer. Um, so the, the state um, gave my lawyer this plea agreement on the 27th. Um, 
I was back in court on the 29th. I had one day to go over the whole thing. Everyone else who uh, accepted the plea had like a month. I only had one day. My um, initial lawyer withdrew from the case because his wife called. Yeah, I'm going to object to my own witness as being not it's responsive. Not responsive. So, sir, answer the question and then you can explain it, okay? Yes or no, and then answer it, and then you can explain it. What sir. was the question again? Did you understand State's Exhibit 16 uniform when yes. it was placed in front of you? Yes. All right. Now, would you please read the very last paragraph of State's Exhibit 16 uniform right above your signature in its entirety? Trontavious Stevens. Starting oh. with the word I. I, I Trontavious Stevens, have read and carefully reviewed this agreement. I have reviewed and corrected where necessary for accurate each statement contained in defendant's factual acknowledgement. And I acknowledge the truth and accuracy of each of each and every statement listed therein. I fully understand this agreement, and I have a, have had an opportunity to discuss this agreement and each of its provisions with my attorney, Miss Chrissy Gladden. No promises other than those contained in this document have been made to me in furtherance of this agreement. I fr I freely, knowingly, and voluntarily enter this agreement without forced threat or court. court. Cord. Thank you. Cord. You knew what it was, though. No, no. It I, wasn't explained to you. Oh, I thought you would ask me about that word. When you signed this document, did you go over this document with your attorney? Yes, but not thoroughly. Okay. Were you asked by Ms. Hilton whether or not you had had time to? And Ms. Hilton is my co-counsel sitting right here. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't know your name. Okay. Were you asked by Ms. Hilton at the time that you put your signature on this document? whether you had had enough time to go over this document with your attorney. Did she ask me that? Um, did she, yes, yes. Did you tell her, yes, you've had enough time? Yes. Did you tell her you needed any more time to go over it with your attorney? Yes. You did tell her that? I told you that, actually. I asked um, because one of the defendants was, you told him that he could come back on Tuesday with his okay. reply, okay. and I asked, can I do the I same thing? Judge, I'm going to object to this as being non-responsive, okay. and I'm going to ask yeah, that. It's non-responsive, so. <laughs> sir, 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 I'm ruling, okay? But don't get a comment on what I say, all right? So, I'm ruling on it. His, his answer is non-responsive, Okay. Do you have another independent objection? Same objection. Well, he's non-responsive, so that's clearly a field. So anyways, continue now. Okay, thank so you. So you have to answer the question, then you can explain it, okay? That's understood, uh, you're on. Okay. Um, did you inform Ms. Hilton at the time that you signed this document that you needed any more time to this with your attorney? No. Did she inform you that if you needed more time, you would be given more time? No, because I asked, asked for more time before even agreeing to it. I asked you. I asked Miss Chrissy Gladden to ask you because is this okay with I'm doing? Can I explain? I answered the question first. Okay. I, I'm not being non responsive. Um, so I asked Miss Christie because I overheard you tell the defendant sitting next to me that he can come back on Tuesday with his answer that, that he has to, to, because it was the weekend, if I'm not mistaken, to, to the best of my knowledge. And I asked if I can do the same thing, and you said no. So during the time that you were going over this document, with, first of all, let me, let me ask you this. Is your testimony that you were given, how much time were you given? How much, when did you find out about the document? That initial document was given to my attorney on the 27th. I think she told me that yesterday. It, it was given to her on the 27th. And I mean you is in your testimony, that the first time that you saw this document or learned about this document, or even talked to your attorney about this document, was 
Jamie signed it. No, oh, I ain't said it. Okay. I, I'm telling you the dates. I got it from, on the 27th, and the 29th was my time to sign. Did you talk with your attorney about this document when you first learned about it? On the 27th? Yes. Yes. Did you ask her the questions that you needed to ask her? Yes. But Did she give you answers? Yes. Did you talk to her anymore about it on the 28th? Yes. And did you talk to her more about it on the 29th? On the 29th. Um, yes. yes. And during the time that you were going over this document uh, with Ms. Hilton, did you stop and correct Ms. Hilton and ask for clarification and understanding at some certain points? I think one time I, I mentioned that I couldn't understand this. And did you where did but, you have? I'm sorry, but that was like just asking her to repeat something <laughs> one time. You think it was, your testimony is that you just asking her to repeat something? Yeah, I read it uh, last night. You want me? So let me ask you this. What is that document you have in your hand? It's the, my transcript of the guilty plea the, for the book. Let me keep reading. I just want, is a transcript of your guilty plea? Yes. Did I give that to you? No. Did anyone from my office give that to you? My lawyer gave it to me yesterday. Did you go over that document with Mr. Steele and Mr. Adams? Yes. Did you give them the document? Yes. Did you give them the copy of the document that you gave to them? Yes. Did you give them the copy of the document that you gave to them? Yes. Did you give them the copy of the document that you gave to them? Yes. Did you give them the copy of the document that you gave to them? Yes. Did you give them the copy of the document that you gave to them? Yes. Did you give them the copy of the document that you gave to them? Yes. Did you give them the copy of the document that you gave to because when you walk past me in the hallway, that's what you stated that me and you was going to go over by me um, coming with you. So I took the initiative to ask my attorney to get me a copy of it so I can go over with her. Is it your testimony that I told you we were going to go over your transcript? Yesterday you said, when we were walking past, you said, come here, we're going to go over the questions. Yes. So why did you ask for your transcript? Because I'll sustain the objection. <clears throat> when I never asked you about a transcript, what prompted you to ask for a transcript? Because you said questions, and these were the only questions that I was asked with my plea agreement. Did I ask you or tell you that I wanted to? about the things I wanted to ask you on the stand. You said I have some questions for you, so, yeah. Now, you said that in your plea agreement, in your factual acknowledgement, you said uh, some other things. So let me ask you to read section two under defendant's factual acknowledgements. The family is one of the founding members of Young Slime Life. And being that you were the defendant signing this, were you one of the founding members of Young Slime Life? Yes. And Young Slime Life, as you noted here, is a gay. Yes. And would you also read section three under defendant's factual acknowledgments? Verbatim. Number three? Yes. Um, defendant committed aggravated assault as alleged in Act One by brandishing a gun at an uncovered police officer that was surveilling a vehicle that was hijacked from a woman. Can I explain? Sure. What is it that you want to explain first? Tell me that. Because I just asked you to read this verbatim. It's not a question. Your Honor. I sustain the, uh, com the issue as the commentary. Okay, just go ahead and continue your next question. Okay, thank you. All right. So, Mr. Stevens, you...
Excuse me, can I say something? Can I? Just a second. All right. Would you also read section seven, eight, and nine, verbatim, <coughs> of 16 uniform? Eight, seven? Seven, yep. The statements this man made to police about Rock Crew and YSL as reflected in section three and section four above are true and accurate. And what about? Number eight. Defendant has been accused of and arrested for robbing women. All right, and number nine. Defendant is the person referred to as Tick in the song by Yonto entitled Ooh. In the verse, she getting robbed by Tick. Okay. Now, do you know um, what it was that that particular song was released? I'm bad with time. I'm going to now show you what's already been in as states exhibit to uniform and I'm going to publish it for the jury draw. I'm showing you two uniforms. Right. Would you tell the jury Mr. what Do you have an objection, sir? It's, a bit, it's been admitted already. Two uniform? Yeah. Any further inquiry? Okay. All right. Go ahead, madam. Would you tell the jury what it is that we are looking at in two uniforms that's displayed on the screen? Yes. Um, it's a tattoo. That permanent ink. That's permanent. All right, and tell the jury what letters are displayed on state's exhibit two uniform. It's a tap. Backing up. I'm sorry about this for being confusing. Who is depicted in state's exhibit two uniform? Me. All right, and what part of your body is depicted in state's two uniform? All is right. that the left side of your abdomen? <clears throat> left side of my abdomen. Right. Yes. And are there letters? written on the left side of your abdomen. Yes. Are they still there? Yes. Is that permanent ink? Yes. Would you tell the jury what the letters that I'm pointing to are? There they go. Those. A Y, an S, and an L. All right. And um, are they colored any particular color? Yes. What are they colored? Red. And is there a sign or anything else above the Y, the S, and the L? Yes. What is that? A Corvette. Car symbol. Okay. Now, is there a sign to or a picture to the left? And in particular here. What is this? Um, a marijuana plant. All right. And below that, what is depicted at the bottom next to the L? Uh, a, a wad of money. Okay. Now, are there other words on the lower part of your app? Yes. And what is that word? Love. And how is the word love spelled out? What are, what pictures are used to spell love? What is the L spelled with? Uh, the L is a gun. What is the O spelled with? A grenade. What is the V spelled with? Uh, two knives. And what is the E spelled with? Three bullets. All right. Now 
show you. Space Exhibit 8 uniform. And 8 uniform 2. Bravo. Like a, that's a snake. Oh, okay. So what is um <laughs> what is it that's depicted on your stomach? What word is it? So I um uh, substituted the initial S to spell slime with a snake. Okay, so it's meant to spell slime. Yes. And the word slime, what does it mean? Mm. Good question. That's a good question. So, the S is for slow, the L is for low, the I is for I, the M is for me, and the E for everything. So, um, That is the only thing that slime meant to you when you had that tattoo put on your body? Yes, ma'am. That's what it means to me. That's what that tattoo means to me. Is slime ever used in any other kind of way? As by you or any of the people that... Like, like, breaking, it, like breaking it down? Sales. Like breaking it down how I did? No, like the meaning of the word slime. Yes, no, yes, slime. Is, why, is, is slime a word used by why? Yes. Okay. And were you one of the founding members of YSL? Yes. All right. Now, who were the other founding members? Um, Walter Murphy uh, and Jeffrey Williams. Uh -huh. And in showing you 10 uniform on the screen. Who is that person depicted in 10 uniform? That's me. Right. And is that something around your neck? Yes. What is that? It's a, a wide cell chain. All right. And showing you 10 uniform, bravo. All right. <coughs> I'm going to put it in front of you so you can see more clearly. It's 10 uniform, bravo, an Instagram post. Yes. Are you tagged in that Instagram post? Yes. And who is it that tagged you in the Instagram post? Who is the photo by? Uh, Thugga Thugga One. Say it out loud. Thugga Thugga One. Thugga Thugga One. Yes. What date was the Instagram post made? Just a minute. Um, looking underneath the word ID next to the word taken, what date is indicated? Mm. Can you see that? Yeah, man. So. Just read the numbers as they appear. 2014, 10, 12. Okay. Is that meant to depict October the 12th of 2014? Yes. Okay. And. Is that the day after you are alleged to have robbed the young lady at gunpoint? That is. I, I'm asking you. I don't know. I, I asked my lawyer yesterday when that date was. Okay. 
Now, I guess so. The text in State's Exhibit 10 Uniform Bravo. Would you read what the text is um, next to the word text? Can you see it on the screen or do you need to bring it up? Yes. All right. What is that text? Him and I. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting oh, actually. I see what's starting right from. Here. So it's a hashtag. Uh huh. Uh, a Y, a, a S and an L. Uh huh. A hashtag, slime life. A hashtag, Haiti hey baby. Uh, an at original slime slow with me. Uh huh. Him and I are the founders of YSL. So brilliant. Followed by 3031. All right. And do you have a tattoo with the word Haiti on your leg? Yes. All right. And is that in permanent name? Yes. And original slime, what was that meant to denote? Um, basically, I was there when it began. Okay. So, when did it begin? <clears throat> hmm. Some dates. Mm. Oh, don't, some dates. Don't. You don't have to be precise. You can talk about generally. When did it begin? We know the picture was in 2014. Is that fair? <coughs> Before then, right? Yeah. Okay. So generally, what year? <clears throat> Probably a year or two prior. I'm, I don't. I, I can't recall the exact date. Right. And where is it that, since you were able to name the other founders, where is it that you all were when you all founded this group? That's more than 10 years. I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I ain't being non responsible. I, I don't recall. And since you're one of the original founders, could you tell the jury just how it came about? Um, <clears throat> so. At the time. It was going through like a phase with the whole rock crew gang ordeal. And decided that wasn't uh, the approach we wanted to take anymore. So the rock crew gang was known for like committing crimes and like being a gang. We was trying to take a different approach. <clears throat> we had a, uh, a passion for music. We often listened to music, loved music. Um, so we said, hey, we're going to change the narrative and try to do something positive by create a music organization. A music organization. Yeah, at, at the time, um, let me go back to that, that statement I made to those detectives. I wasn't telling them, hey, I could, is this being my response? Mm -hmm. So I wasn't telling them, hey, I'm not committing crimes under the name Rock Crew or gang bang up under the name Rock Crew no more. I'm committing crimes upon a wide cell and gang bang upon a wide cell. That wasn't my direction with the statement I was making. I was trying to tell them, hey, 
kind of trying to put their rock crew narrative behind me and switch it up to something positive. And at that time, it was like a window open for us to like do music. So that's the approach. In that initial statement, I said, hey, we're no longer going by that. We got a music situation going on. Stand for Young Slime Life. We even go by it saying that it's Young Successful Living, trying to put the whole rock crew gang banging narrative behind us and take a different approach. Um, let's break that apart a little bit, okay? Um, Young Slime Life, you said you referenced the whole rock crew gang ordeal. What, 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 what are you doing? Being known for rock crew and gang banging and command crimes. And that was all three founders' intent to put that whole rock crew gang ordeal behind you? Some of the founders wasn't even a part of the rock crew whole thing. That was their way of grasping me saying, hey, let's do something different while you got the chance to. You mentioned the statement that you gave to the detectives. I am going to show you state's uniform once more and ask you to read number six under defendant's factual acknowledgments on page three. Would you read it verbatim? Defendants advised law enforcement that YSL already stood for Young Slime Life, but the group began calling itself Young Successful Lifestyle after Jeffrey Williams, a.k.a. Young Thor, signed a record deal. Okay. That's what I did. So... Why did you change the name after he signed a record deal? So, Young Slime Life sounded more suitable to like listening ears. I mean, truth be told, that's what people want to hear. And once you get in and kick the door down, you can, like, change the situation on how people look at you. But initially, they won't, you know, sound like. But once you, yeah. You said they want young slime life. What about young slime life? Was it that you believed people wanted? Ms. Chapter, I'm sorry. Ms. Love, can um, we put a pin in that before he answers that question and uh, let our jury have a comfort break? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take a comfort break and let's come back for um, 4 o'clock, okay? And uh, we'll see where the day, day leads us at that point in time. All right, all right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Our jurors left us. Uh, Mr. Stevens, you can step out and take 15 minutes and come back, okay? Yes, yes uh, sir. All right, don't discuss the testimony. Anybody except your, your attorneys, okay? Love and uh, let me get a couple of representatives from the defense. Can you all come up for a second, please?
all the other things. But I think the album cover at that, color, that time was like that color or something. Was the red in any way indicative of the blood gang? Indicative, I'm sorry. I was it meant to stand for, um, represent? Not from my understanding. So you don't, no. that had nothing to do with sex, money, murder, or blood? Yeah. Okay. Now your legal name is Trontavious Keith. What's your whole name? Trontavious, what's your middle name? Kendale. Kendale. Are you also called Tick? Yes. And how is that spelled? T I C K. Right. Are you also called Slug? Yes. How is that spelled? S L U G. Have you ever had um, the Instagram handle Original Slime underscore Slug? Yes. All right. And how long uh, have you had that handle? Do you know since what year approximately? How long did I have a handle? Did you have in 2014? I'm trying to think because I actually lost that page when I went to prison because of I ain't had no phone or anything. Prior to 2015, is it fair to say you had that handle? Prior to 2015, yes. Okay. And are you familiar with a handle, other, other one? Yes. How are you familiar with that handle? Um, Whose handle is that? Um, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Yeah, that's like yeah. Jeffrey Williams. Okay. The same Jeffrey Williams in the courtroom today? Yes. All right. I'm going to show you what I marked as 10 <laughs> Ten uniform, Bravo, lowercase Bravo. Eleven uniform, eleven uniform, Bravo. Twelve uniform. And ask you if you recognize the images depicted in first starting with ten uniform. Yes. All right. Ten uniform Bravo, is that your face? Yes. Your person? Yes. And you don't need reading glasses, do you? Because I'm not. No. Okay. All right. Can you see, without talking to the jury, um, do you see yes. your Instagram handle? Yes. And do you see the Instagram handle that you referenced a minute ago as well. Yes. All right. Are these fair and accurate images so far? Yes. All right. What about 11 uniform? Do you recognize that? Yes. All right. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of the people who have been photographed in 11 uniform? Is this a fair oh, copy yes. of the picture? Yeah. All right. And showing you 11 uniform Bravo. <coughs> Do you recognize the Instagram handle on 11 Uniform Bravo? Yes. Is that yours? Yes. All right. So is this a fair and accurate reflection of 11 Uniform Bravo? Yes. Showing you 12 Uniform. Do you recognize 12 Uniform? Yes. All right. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of the folks that are depicted inside? Yes. Your Honor, the state tended to this time. 10 Uniform, 10 Uniform Bravo. <clears throat> 11 uniform, 11 uniform, Bravo, and 12 uniform. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sure. Here, and um, just for clarity, this is uh, each of those that I had provided. Yes, I see the other. Uh, any objections to uh, 10 uniform, 10 uniform, Bravo, 11 uniform, 11 uniform, Bravo, 12 uniform, or 12 uniform, Bravo? All right. Uh, those are admitted. Um, they may be published as you see fit. Thank you, Mr. Chief, you mentioned merch earlier. 
Yes. What is it?
Would you please tell the jury what date it is that you signed 16 uniform? December 29th, 2022. Okay. Now, were you forced to sign 16 uniform? No. Okay. Persuaded, but not forced. You were persuaded. Yeah. So are you stating now under oath that you did not sign 16 uniform yes, I, freely I, and voluntarily? Yes, yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You signed it freely and voluntarily. Yes. And you understood what you were signing? Did you understand what you were signing? It's a better question. So the state's initial offer with his plea was on the 27th. I asked the gentleman to allow the finish the Yeah, let me answer and then explain. The answer was affirmative or negative, and he did not answer. So I asked You got him on direct, though. Uh, right. All right. So, so, okay, all right. I'm, so, I'm going to sustain the objection. Go ahead and do, go ahead and ask him or let him complete his, you know, his answer. Did you understand 16 uniform? So that was part of my answer. Um, so the, the state um, gave my lawyer this plea agreement on the 27th. Um, I was back in court on the 29th. I had one day to go over the whole thing. Everyone else who uh, set the plea had like a month. I only had one day. My um, initial lawyer withdrew from the case because his wife called. I'm going to object to my own witness as being not responsive. So, so answer the question and then you can explain it, okay? Yes or no, and then answer it, and then you can explain it. What was the question again? Did you understand State's Exhibit 16 uniform when it was placed in front of you? Yes. All right. Now, would you please read the very last paragraph of State's Exhibit 16 uniform right above your signature in its entirety? Trontavious Stevens. Yeah, with the word I. I, I Stevens, have read and carefully reviewed this agreement. I have reviewed and corrected when necessary for accurate each statement pertaining and defendant's factual acknowledgement. And I acknowledge the truth and accuracy of each of each and every statement listed therein. I fully understand this agreement and I have a, have had an opportunity to discuss this agreement and each of its provisions with my attorney, Ms. Chrissy Gladden. No promises other than those contained in this document have been made to me in furtherance of this agreement. I, I freely, willingly, and voluntarily enter this agreement without force, threat, or court. court. Coercion. Coercion. Thank you. Coercion. You knew what it was, though. No, no. It I, wasn't explained to you. Oh, I thought you were asking me about that word. When you signed this document, did you go over this document with your attorney? Yes, but not thoroughly. Okay. Were you asked by Ms. Hilton whether or not you had had time to, and Ms. Hilton is my co counsel sitting right here. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't know your name. Okay. Were you asked by Ms. Hilton at the time that you put your signature on this document whether you had had enough time to go over this document with your attorney? Yes, you asked me Yes, yes, yes. Did you tell her, yes, you've had enough time? Yes. Did you tell her you needed any more time to go over it with your attorney? Yes. You did tell her that? I told you that, actually. I asked um, because one of the defendants was, you told him that he could come back on Tuesday over here to okay. reply, okay. and I asked, can I do the same I'm thing? Judge, I'm going to object to this as being non-responsive, okay. and I'm going to ask yeah, that. It's non-responsive, so. <laughs> sir, 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 I'm you, okay? But don't get a comment on what I say, all right? So, I'm ruling on it, it's, it the answer's non-responsive. Okay. Do you have another independent objection? The same objection. Well, he's non-responsive, so that's clearly a field. So, anyways, continue now. Okay. So you. you have to answer the question, then you can explain it. Okay. That's on still you. Okay. Um, did you inform Miss Hilton at the time that you signed this document? That you need any more time to discuss this with your 
did she inform you that if you needed more time, you would be given more time? No, because I actually asked for more time before even agreeing to it. I asked you. I asked Miss Chrissy Gladdy to ask you because is this okay with her room? Can I explain? I answered the question first. Okay. Well, I'm not being more responsive. Um, so I asked Miss Chrissy because I overheard you tell the defendant sitting next to me that he can come back on Tuesday with his answer that, that he has to, to, because it was the weekend, if I'm not mistaken, to, to the best of my knowledge. And I asked if I can do the same thing, and you said no. So during the time that you were going over this document, with, first of all, let me ask you this. Is your testimony that you were given, how much time were you given? How much, when did you find out about this document? That initial document was given to my attorney on the 27th. I think she told me that yesterday. It, it was given to her on the 27th. And okay, you is in your testimony that the first time that you saw this document or learned about this document or even talked to your attorney about this document was the day you signed it. No, I didn't say that. Okay. I, I'm telling you the dates. I got it from, on the 27th and the 29th was my time to sign. Did you talk with your attorney about this document when you first learned about it? On the 27th? Yes. Yes. Did you ask her the questions that you needed to ask her? Yes. Did she give you answers? Yes. Did you talk to her any more about it? On the 28th? Yes. And did you talk to her more about it on the 29th? On the 29th. Um, yes. yes. And during the time that you were going over this document uh, with Ms. Hilton, did you stop and correct Ms. Hilton and ask for clarification and understanding at some certain points? I think one time I, I mentioned that I couldn't understand this. And did you wear the I'm sorry, but that was like just asking her to repeat something one time. You think it was, your testimony is that you just asking her to repeat something? Yeah, I read it uh, last night. You want me? So let me ask you this. What is that document you have in your hand? It's the, my transcript of the guilty plea the, for the, the, let me keep reading. I just want, it's a transcript of your guilty plea? Yes. Did I get that? To remind me, okay. All right. Summon our jurors, source, please. Thank you. Thank you. 
picture. That's fine. He's just fine. Hmm? You know, when you can warm up. Remember the one you brought in to warm up? Yeah. It didn't last long. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. All right, thank you, Sergeant Ingram. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're going to go just um, to let you know probably about a little less than an hour or thereabouts, and then I'll, we'll uh, recess for the day, and I'll go ahead and give you instructions about tomorrow and the day after, okay? All right, so we're going to continue with the examination of Mr. Stevens. So go right ahead, Ms. Love. Thank you, guys. Uh, Mr. Stevens, do you need anything? Are you okay? I'm okay. So before we took the recess, you talked about uh, the people wanting, or a young slide might be more of what the people want. Would you explain what you meant by that? Um. <clears throat> so the image... We felt like we needed to portray was the rough and rugged in order to like grasp the attention of the listeners because that's what it seems like was selling at the time. And how was it that you all portrayed rough and rugged to the listeners through the name Young Slime Life? So on the on the image that you uh displayed, it was on my tattoos, it was like a Corvette symbol, a marijuana symbol, some a money symbol. <coughs> that was all in like representation of the approach, you know. The, the lifestyle, that's what was up under the, and that was the name of the song, what the lifestyle was about. And that's what we're going with. So, um, the lifestyle was about violence? Is that what you're saying? I, I never say that. Okay. Go ahead and help me understand how your tattoos and those symbols that are on your body were meant to display a rough and rugged image to the audience. Fast cars, smoking weed, money. <coughs> that, those are like characteristics of being a street dude. And was all of this before you all actually did anything in music? Or was this, help me understand, when you were, when you were talking it out, how were you 
What was the conversation? I'm sorry. When you came up, when you all came up with the name Young Slime Life, why did you choose Young Slime Life? Like I said earlier, music was a passion, and that's what one of our, like, inspirations to do music, that's what he was rapping about. So, he and, um, I'm talking about Lil Wayne. Okay, yeah. so it came from Lil Wayne, the word slime. I mean, that's what we got familiar with. That's what we heard from. And is that why you all call yourselves Young Slime Life? Yeah, because of the, like, impact. All the movies we seen on him, the music we heard from him. And based on what you heard and saw from him and everything else, what is Slime <laughs> What was slime meant to represent for you all when you all put it in your name? I don't, I don't know, but we just, I just knew he was the coolest dude in the world to me. So really wanted to like be what he was doing. Why not call yourself Lil Wayne? Because he, he had already made a name for himself using that. So maybe if we say what he's saying, we can get his attention. That was that was so big to us, living and moving how he was moving. Were you at um, his show when he performed here in 2015 at the compound? Yes. How many of you, uh, were, were there other YSL members that showed up at that show? Yes. How many of you all would you say showed up at that show? So, I'm well, not being non sponsor but this particular day was my birthday. Mm -hmm. So, everyone was like trying to go out and have a good time and help me celebrate. Okay. And so, did you all go to the beginning of the shop? No. So, did you all show up? After the show was over? No, we, we actually made it. Like, why the club? It, it wasn't really a, a show. It, yeah, it wasn't a show. It was him being there. Okay. So you all went to the beginning of the show? Yes. And so what was the name of the show? Young Slime Life. And so why did you all bring guns to Lil Wayne's show at the compound in 2015 that he was you all's idol? I didn't have a gun. I don't know anything about a gun. I was, I don't know nothing about that whole situation. I was there to enjoy myself, have a good time. It was my birthday. What whole situation? The, the situation with the one. And what was the situation that you were referring to? So his, uh, his tour bus was allegedly shot up. Well, not allegedly, it was shot up. Okay. All right. And so you didn't have anything to do with that situation. Why did you distinguish yourself from everybody else? You said, I didn't have anything to do with that situation. Yeah. yeah. My intention on going out the night was having a good time. We were just club hopping, smoking weed, and drinking liquor, and celebrating. But you, were you aware that? Multiple members of the people that you came to the compound with were carrying guns? I didn't see anyone with no gun. I drove my own car. Okay. There were no guns in my car. Okay. Now, do you remember what time you all got to the compound? No. And did you ever even go inside the compound? Yes. How long did you stay inside? Um... <clears throat> Probably, I don't know, like, you know, three years back, too old. It wasn't too long. Was it probably half an hour, probably more like a half an hour. Half an hour? Yeah. Was that at the end or at the middle or at the beginning of his presence there? 
<clears throat> so when the art is that big, you really don't get a chance to see them. It's about being in the same vicinity as the sensitivity, if that's the word I'm looking for. By being in the same vicinity as like a person that big, okay. a caliber. So who all went into the compound while you were inside the compound that were a part of this group with YSL that you came in? So I actually left everyone outside. They was charging roughly $500 to get in because of the time and that you had to have tickets. And everyone was acting like they didn't have, no, well, not acting like they probably didn't have no money. But I had money and I wanted to enjoy myself and that's what I did. I took it upon myself to, I drove my own car, so I took it upon myself to go in and, and, and see my idol. You said, okay, your idol. Um, now, was your co-founder of YSL having any words across the media <coughs> or any other way with your idol? during the time that Lil Wayne had his show or appeared at the compound? That... I don't know, I just feel like that caliber of person, you won't even get the chance to have words with him like that. Especially not a young, up-and-coming artist who technically ain't even made a name for himself yet. Who was the young up and coming artist who had technically not made a name for himself yet? Jeffrey Williams. Okay. Was Jeffrey Williams with you all at the compound? No. What was Jeffrey Williams? Um, um, why don't you rephrase the question? I'll stay in this room. Yes, you okay. Are you aware of where Jeffrey Williams was the night that Lil Wayne appeared at the compound in 2015 when you all as YSL went to the compound. From my understanding. Excuse me, we're objecting to you all. Your Honor, the witnesses testified. Oh, I'm objecting at this point. Hey, 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 Mrs. T hey, Mr. Harvey, we're not going to have any of that. I'll sustain your objection, okay? We're not going to be belligerent to one another. You can rephrase. Yes, Your Honor. When YSL was at the compound, are you aware of where Jeffrey Williams was? Um, yes. Where was Jeffrey Williams? He was on tour. Where was he appearing the night that YSL was at the compound for a little wine Foundation? I'm gonna overrule that. You may answer. You can answer the question, sir. <laughs> um, from my understanding, he was in New Orleans. Well, sir, do you know where he was? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, then yes. you can't speculate. Oh. Okay, right, so yes, if you know where he is, fine. If you don't know where he is, then tell tell the examiner that, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir, Your Honor. Yes. What part of the world? I don't know. Do you, are you aware of whether or not he was in Little Wayne's hometown? No. Do you have any reason why you all, why Isel wasn't in New Orleans with Jeffrey Williams? At the time, Jeffrey Williams, co-founder of YSL, was performing. Basis. Oh, rule, sir. You may answer the question. So again, um, this round of time where he was up and coming, and it really didn't make any sense for him to buy all those plane tickets when he probably was making only $5,000 a show at the time. So it won't be no profit in paying for all our flight tickets. That's what I feel like, that's how I feel. Okay, well, why didn't you? I move to strike his answer as all speculative based on his last statement. I object. I'll the objection. Now, why didn't YSL just pay for their own flights if it was to support a founding member of the group? 
I was just saying it's a form, but you know, that's already come out, Mr. Uh, Matthew, so I I'm going to rule your, your, your first objection, okay? So rephrase this to why, okay? So unless he knows, then that, that, that invites speculation. Okay. You specifically, why didn't you just pay for your own ticket to go and support your co-founder? while your co-founder was performing in New Orleans? So at the time, uh, I had a case pending and I was on ankle monitor, house arrest. Mm -hmm. yes. Did you have a curfew at the time? No, it was more of knowing my whereabouts at all times. Were you able to let your probation officer know or parole officer know? Do you need to go somewhere other than where you were? I, I wasn't on parole. Mr. Steele, you, you can. Okay. <clears throat> Make sure this one's on here.
So at the time, we was going through like a phase with the whole rock crew gang ordeal. And decided that wasn't uh, the approach we wanted to take anymore. So the rock crew gang was known for like committing crimes and like being a gang. We was trying to take a different approach. We had a, a passion for music. We often listen to music, love music. Um, so we said, hey, we're going to change the narrative and try to do something positive by create a music organization. A music organization. Yeah, at, at the time, um, let me go back to that statement I made to those detectives. I wasn't telling them, hey, I could, is this being non sponsored? I mean, yeah. So I wasn't telling them, hey, I'm not committing crimes under the name Rock Crew or gangbang upon the name Rock Crew no more. I'm committing crimes upon a wide cell and gangbang upon a wide cell. That wasn't my direction with the statement I was making. I was trying to tell them, hey, kind of trying to put that Rock Crew narrative behind me and switch it up to something positive and at that time it was like a window open for us to like do music. So that's the approach. In that initial statement I said, hey, we're no longer going by that. We got a music situation going on. Stand for Young Swine Life. We even go by saying that it's young successful living, trying to put the whole rock crew gang thing in there to bind us and take a different approach. Um, let's break that apart a little bit, okay? You said the, you referenced the whole rock crew gang ordeal. What, what, is, what, what ordeal? Being known for rock crew and gang banging and committing crimes. And that was all three founders' intent to put that whole rock crew gang ordeal behind you? Some of the founders wasn't even a part of the rock crew whole thing. That was their way of grasping me saying, hey, let's do something different. Why you got the chance to? You mentioned the statement that you gave to the detectives. I am going to show you State's uniform once more and ask you to read number six under defendant's factual acknowledgments on page three. Would you read it verbatim? Defendants advised law enforcement that YSL originally stood for Young Slime Life, but the group began calling itself Young Successful Lifestyle after Jeffrey Williams, aka Young Thor, signed a record. Yeah. Okay. That's what I just. So, why did you change the name after he signed a record deal? So, Young know, Slime Life sounded more suitable to like listening ears. I mean, truth be told, that's what people want to hear. And once you get in, 
kick the door down, you can like change the situation on how people look at you, but initially they won't. You know what I'm saying? Like, but once you can. You said they want young slime life. What about young slime life was it that you believed people wanted? Miss Jonathan, I'm sorry. Miss Love, can um, we put a pin in that before he answers that question and uh, let our jury have a comfort break? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take a comfort break and let's come back for um, 4 o'clock, okay? And uh, we'll see where the day, day leads us at that point in time.
just uh, to let you know, probably about a little less than an hour or thereabouts, and then I'll we'll uh, recess for the day, and I'll go ahead and give you instructions about tomorrow and the day after. Okay. All right. So we're going to continue with the examination, of Mr. Stevens. So go right ahead, Ms. Love. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Mr. Stevens, do you need anything? Are you okay? I'm okay. All right. So before we took the recess, you talked about. The people wanting, or a young slide might be more of what the people want. Would you explain what you meant by that? Um. <clears throat> so the image. <clears throat> We felt like we needed to portray was the rough and rugged in order to like grasp the attention of the listeners because that's what it seems like was selling at the time. And how was it that you all portrayed rough and rugged to the listeners through the name Young Slime Life? So on the on the image that you uh displayed, it was on my tattoos, it was like a Corvette symbol, a marijuana symbol, some a money symbol. That was all in like representation of the approach, you know. The, the lifestyle, that's what was up under the, and that was the name of the song, what the lifestyle was about. And that's what we were doing. So, um, the lifestyle, was about violence? Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm going to say that. Okay. Go ahead and help me understand how your tattoos and those symbols that are on your body were meant to display a rough and rugged image to listeners. Fast cars, smoking weed, money. That, those are like characteristics of being a street dude. And was all of this before you all actually did anything in music? Or was this help me understand when you were when you were talking it out, how were you what was the conversation? I'm sorry. When you came up, when you all came up with the name Young Slime Life, why did you choose Young Slime Life? Like I said earlier, music was a passion, and that's what one of our like inspirations to do music. That's what he was rapping about. So we <laughs> end. Um, I'm talking about Lil Wayne. Okay. Yeah. So it came from Lil Wayne. The word slime. I mean, that's what we got familiar with. That's what we heard from. And is that why you all call yourselves young slime life? Yes, because of the like impact. All the movies we seen on him, the music we heard from him. And based on what you heard and saw from him and everything else, what is slime? What was slime meant to represent for you all when you all put it in your name? I don't, I don't know, but we just, I just knew he was the coolest dude in the world to me. So, really wanted to like be what he was, do what he was doing. Why not call yourself Lil Wayne? Like, I'm just curious. Because he, he had already 
made a name for himself using that. So maybe if we say what he's saying, we can get his attention. That was, that was so big to us, living and moving how he was moving. Were you at uh, his show when he performed here in 2015 at the compound? Yes. How many of the, uh, were, were there other YSL members that showed up at that show? Yes. How many of you all would you say showed up at that show? So, uh, I'm not being my sponsor, but this particular day was my birthday. Mm -hmm. So everyone was like trying to go out and have a good time and help me celebrate. Okay. And so did you all go to the beginning of the show? No. So did you all show up? the show was over? No, we, we actually made it like while the club it, it wasn't really a, a show. It, yeah, it wasn't a show, it was him being there. Okay. And so was Jimmy Winfrey with you all? Yes. And so um you all came together like all as one. Yes. Alright. And so why did you all bring guns to Lil Wayne's show at the compound in twenty fifteen if he was you all
I understand since when your member doesn't does not feel the best, and given the fact it's nearly five o'clock, and it, I just make the executive decision that we're going to recess for today. As I told you earlier, we were probably going to do that anyway. So. Um, let me just kind of talk with you just in broad strokes about what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we're going to have kind of a short work day. I'd like you all to be here for 9 o'clock. Uh, we're going to start somewhere between 9 and 9.30, and we'll work probably till about the noontime hour, and then that will be, will be complete for Thursday. Um, Friday... Um, I have some unrelated business that I customarily take up that you were familiar with from a couple of earlier Fridays, uh, Veterans Court, so I'll be taking that up Friday morning. Um, so I'm still not um, sure whether or not we're going to hold court on Friday afternoon. Um, that's going to be dependent upon some things that the lawyers tell me tomorrow, okay? So I will let you know by close of business tomorrow whether whether or not we will do anything on Friday or we'll just recess until Monday, okay? So for sure tomorrow for a couple hours or there-ish, and then Friday I'll let you know, okay? All right, any minister inquiry of me before I give you your customary admonitions? Anybody? You all like the space back there? Yes. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, all right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go through the, of course, the ad nauseum admonitions, which you have been so gracious and professional in, in adhering to still. Remember, don't discuss the matter as you're going uh, home this evening. I know the temptation is great. People will approach you and say, hey, what's going on? Um, I know the temptation is great to listen to other accounts of this particular trial, but remember, those things are not within your purview. You need to, as I, as I mentioned earlier, stand fast with the, you can only consider what's been presented in the four walls of this courtroom, okay? So, uh, remember, if anybody should try and meet you by any mode, means of communication, that you need to let start, um, Sergeant Ingram and myself know immediately so that that steps can be taken, but that um, nobody's supposed to except for those authorized to have any direct or indirect contact with you. And as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, while I've asked you all to come off of social media, those people that still may be on social media, it would be improper for them to try and discuss the matter of what's going on or other things that have been posted or otherwise that you have not properly heard within the four walls of this courtroom. So just remember those things and uh, continue to adhere to these uh, these admonitions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, unless you have anything else, uh, any other questions of me, anybody? Okay, so tomorrow, 9 o'clock, uh, be here for that time, and then uh, we'll get started somewhere between 9 and 9.30. We'll take a couple hours of testimony, and then we'll be out of here for Thursday, and then I'll let you know by the close of business tomorrow what our plans are for Friday. And just remember, forecasting, we'll work a regular week next week. Um, and then the following Monday, we'll start the King Week. So the 15th is the King holiday. You'd be off anyways. So that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday will be administrative days for, for us. So you can plan on taking any business that you need or any other things you need to take care of. And um, But just to give you kind of some insight, and then um, we'll, uh, we'll schedule accordingly, okay? All right. Well, if you have any other inquiry of me, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience, your continued patience, and the patience you'll continue to give us um, in the resolution of this matter. And uh, with that, we'll see you in the morning, okay? Remember to leave your notepads in the basket. Do not take them home with you. And um, uh, you're probably missing uh, Miss Amana. She wasn't feeling all day either, so she'll be back tomorrow, okay? All right, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, all rise. <laughs> Not far.
I'm not falling for that trick again. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Our jury has left us. Um, all right. Uh, Ms. Lowe, prior to uh, earlier, about an hour ago or thereabouts, you were about to mention something about your checking on the record as it pertains to Mr. Steele. And I know that there was a motion for that was made, and I've already ruled on that in terms of mistrial. So do you have anything else you wanted to add at this point in time? I did, Your Honor. Just for the record, um, we had already introduced as Exhibit 77C, I believe, 77 Indigo. Um, India. Was, India? India. The certified conviction for Mr. Nichols previously. Okay. Um, I, I will still um, note Mr. Um, Schartz uh, and Mr. Harvey's, uh, I should say, objection for the record. Okay. Yeah, it was here at the bench. It was a properly recorded bench conference. You moved for mistrial on the basis of, um, of, of the witness testifying about um, prison. And I, and I said, I'll take up all that stuff later. Yeah, I mean, but it's been testified to or presented on the record already. Okay, sir. All right. Does anybody have any other ministerial inquiry of me at this point in time? Not from the state. I didn't. I, I'm just kind of being kind, Mr. Um, <laughs> yes, Mr. Matthews, what would you like to present? I just want to clarify, never a motion for mistrial, but a motion to declare a particular well, it depends. It, it depends upon the circumstances of the mistrial. Like that doesn't have anything to do with you and your client. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that I don't think it would be proper at that point in time for you, unless you have an independent basis. So that's why I'm saying if it's something that affects all of you, I will note it, and you won't have to do that. But. Since that particular motion was specific to, to Mr. Uh, Stilwell, or Mr. Nichols, I should say, then I, uh, I, that's why I, I made the motion. But the Harvey rule is still in effect, okay? Thank you. All right. Anyone else? All right. Unless you have anything else, anything else about scheduling I need to take up with you uh, at this point in time? Are we set? Um, for witnesses and witness availability, Ms. Love and, and um, yes, Your Honor. Ms. Hilton. Yes, Your Honor. Have you already gone through the the, the next several weeks with uh, with defense counsel? We've gone through the next week, um, but uh, we have not gone past the King holiday. We will get that to them before. Uh, by All right, so, so if you need to take up any witnesses or interview any witnesses during that week, that's my purpose for that week. For you all to be able to do that, okay? Yeah. So, I'd like to hear something on your plans for that um, by the end of close of business tomorrow, okay? We will, and Your Honor, we have just um, so that the court is aware, we have that has been an ongoing occurrence um, with respect to the witnesses and uh, providing the availability of those. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, then we're in recess. I'll see you all tomorrow morning for nine o'clock. Okay. All right. We're in recess.